Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Tuesday, July 2nd meeting of the Urban Village Development Commission. Uh, happy 4th of July week to everybody, Independence Day. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the, uh, the meeting minutes from Tuesday, June 18th. Uh, just a short couple of weeks ago, and uh, anybody have any comments or questions or edits? Did y'all get a chance to look at it? Yes. You did? Okay. I s any comments? No? I saw in the staff report a lot of our questions in here were, have been answered, so we can get into that detail later, but anything on the minutes? No. Okay. I have a motion. I move to accept the minutes for the uh, June 18th meeting. I second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. It's passed. Let's move on to uh, Swedish Development Agreement. Lucy? Is this there your we first go. time here? <laughs> no. Just was not going to do it. So um, I think you, most of you know that the, we're looking at a development agreement next month for Swedish. And um, just as a little bit of introduction for some of our new members, um, Swedish Hospital owns about 17 acres, and they did a site development permit for the for the hospital and medical office building, maybe in 2010, and um, that's been a successful project for them. And um, Port Blakely is, uh, you know, closing out, trying to close out this year, is selling, trying to close sales on all of their property, and. Swedish and uh, Port Blakely have been talking, and they've entered into a preliminary agreement. Um, so, however, the existing Issaquah Highlands development agreement expires in 2017, which may not be enough time for them to finish building out the land they're, they're looking at purchasing, which is what we call, jokingly, the donut hole, the sort of big empty block north of the hospital. And um, so, We've been talking about ways to extend um, the development agreement time frame. And to do that, we're essentially doing a major modification to the development agreement, um, mostly uh, adopting chapters that you have uh, approved for Rally or Lakeside in the last two years. So we're, we're bringing it up to date. Um, many of the chapters, and I'll hand out a chart in just a minute that we can talk about, uh, many of those chapters are ones that you have, as I said, approved and no changes are being made other than changing the names. And there are a few that are um, being written just for this, and you'll see those as well. Um, so the idea is tonight, um, we'll, I'll walk you through this chart. Um, since you haven't seen it, um, I don't plan on us talking about it tonight. We'll talk about it at our next um, UVDC meeting, so you have some time to think about it, and if you have questions. Um, let me just hand that out. So this isn't the most intuitive order, but since you're maybe more familiar with the Issaquah Highlands Development Agreement than other ones, I thought I'd start with this. Um, so the left-hand column is all the components of the existing Issaquah Highlands Development Agreement, which is the main body and 20-plus um, appendices. Then um, the Right two columns are really giving you an indication of how these are um, the sources and how we're writing these. So you can see that, for instance, um, the main body is coming from Lakeside. The definitions are coming from Lakeside. Um, the goals and land uses will be written for Swedish, but the goals will start with the guiding principles of Issaquah Highlands and sort of build that up to, um, we'll sort of edit it down from its current state and build it more like um, a goals appendix that you're used to seeing in Lakeside and Raleigh. So um, 
most of these are uh, doing exactly that where we're starting with an existing document and we're either using it as is or modifying it. So any confusion? Okay. No. Okay. So um, we'll talk more about this next time. I just want to um, briefly introduce three people who are here from Swedish tonight. One is Chuck Salmon. Um, I'm not going to give their titles because I don't think I can do that. Uh, Alex Gross, and then their counsel, Mike Robinson. Good evening. Do you welcome? Do you guys want to say anything? You're in for a rousing evening tonight. So. <laughs> we'll see how long they stay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Alex. Yeah. Would you come up to a microphone just that way um, the audience, the home audience can hear you? So Chuck and I have been involved in the hospital for many years. I think the mic's not on yet. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Is that better? Yeah. There we go. So Chuck and I have been involved with the development of Isqua Hospital for many years now. It's come a long way. It's been, uh, I've taken a lot of pride in this, uh, in particular because I actually grew up in Issaquah. I uh, moved here in 1978. When I moved here, we didn't have a stoplight. So to see where we are today with uh, world-class healthcare services in our community is just, it's, it's great for us. And so now we're facing the, uh, I guess a good problem in the fact that we've grown so much in the, the last two years we've been here that uh, we're running out of space. We, uh, we don't have the capacity to, to grow our medical staff and continue to build our Esqua Hospital into a really robust community uh, hospital and asset to, the, asset to all of us. So uh, we'll be continuing to work with the city, and uh, I appreciate everybody's time. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So, Chuck, if you want to. I don't have anything to add. Uh, Alex is a speech giver, and he does a good job of that. So. <laughs> okay. But if you have any Thanks. questions, we're happy to answer them. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I can, I mean, I can speak personally, and probably for the commission. We had a great process going to the, the first part of that, and and it's a real gem for this area. So thank you. Okay. So are we moving on now, Lucy? Anything more on that? Okay. Appearance, appearance of fairness doctrine in quasi judicial proceedings. So this evening, uh, you are the decision maker. So um, I'd like to start by asking if anyone's have any, had any conversations outside of these chambers with someone about this permit? No. No. Uh, I had a conversation with Chantal this morning saying that tonight we're making a decision. It was as an elder uh, commissioner, I wanted to make sure she'd show up and, <laughs> and said that you know you can either vote it up or vote it down or say we need more time. So we had that conversation. That was it. It was process oriented. Right, and I think that's a good point, Nina. It was not about the content; it was about the process. Um, and then, does anyone um, have any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict of interest in terms of knowing someone or? I didn't think of this earlier, but uh, last week uh, I had a gentleman contact me. This is tangential, but I wanted to bring it up for your consideration. As editor and publisher of Connections News in Issaquah Highlands, uh, I was part of a conversation in which Polygon was looking for its advertising opportunities through a marketing agent, and it was the marketing agent who was looking for information from my office, which I provided, and I thought, oh, my goodness. I guess I might like to have Polygon advertise with me someday. That could be something people would like to know. But I don't think that that provides a conflict of interest uh, in this deliberation. It's not motivated by and it's not leveraged by it either. And they've never been an advertiser. So you still really have no make hope. A, a fair and unbiased decision? Yeah, indeed. Okay. Any objections? None? Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the public hearing for the site development permit application for Brownstones, Edisquah Highlands, and Polygon Northwest SDP 13-0002. I do want to point out that there will be time for public comment, so if you could put your name on the list if you're interested in speaking, we'll call for the public mm -hmm. testimony uh, in a little while. <coughs> and, uh, oh, sorry. All right. 
Mike. Good evening. My name is Mike Martin. I'm an associate planner with the Development Services Department. Uh, this discussion continues from, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies. This discussion carries on from our last meeting on June 18th. Again, this is the site development permit, permit number STP 130002, uh, multifamily project for Polygon Northwest at blocks 21 and 22 in Issaquah Highlands. I'm just going to give you a quick one minute overview again just to refresh everybody's memory. And I apologize, we have kind of a blurry screen tonight, so I hope you guys can see that. Um, aerial view. Uh, here's our project, blocks 21 and 22. To the south, block 24, Discovery Heights. Our surrounding streets to the south are Northeast Discovery Drive. <clears throat> excuse me. To the east, Northeast Ellis Drive. Or excuse me, 10th. To the north, Northeast Ellis. And Highlands Drive to the west. Swedish is located down here to the southwest. I think we're all familiar generally with where the project is. Take a look at the site plan. This is the one provided by the applicant. We have two blocks here, blocks 21 on the left-hand side and block 22 on the right-hand side, as well as track QV, which is a pedestrian plaza, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a little bit, but this one shows the roads. This, this project is served internally by alleys, and the connections to the front doors are served by pedestrian trails or by the sidewalk that <coughs> is located on the outside of the street. <clears throat> Lastly, we have two open spaces on either side within each block, one the triangular one and then a little bit smaller one in block 22. So jumping right into our responses, the way I've laid this out is in the memo that was handed out in your packet, um, during last week's meeting, the commission identified questions and concerns. I've combined all of those into 20 responses and I'm just going to hit on each one briefly and at the end if you have questions that you'd like to ask please feel free but I'll try to get through these as quickly as I can. Uh, number one concerns the plaza. Where does the plaza requirement originate from? Uh, the plaza requirement started with commitment four under the original development agreement <clears throat> and um, how much plaza is required. Per the notice of plaza uh, that's attached with the original staff report. The plaza in tract, well, in block 21, which is now tract QV, is required to be between four and 15,000 square feet. And the applicant is proposing between 15 and 20,000 square feet. So they meet that requirement. <clears throat> Number two, plaza design. We took a few photos from, from similar plazas that we think this one might feel like as you can see, um, it's somewhat of a narrow plaza. It's going to be between, I think, 30 and 40 feet wide. Uh, the applicant did, I guess I don't have it here. Um, well, let me just talk about what the design requirements are. The design requirements come from Appendix U of the development agreement as well as Appendix S. Those spell out the guidelines and standards for the plaza. And additionally, um, the commitment from development agreement, commitment number four, was later modified. And I'm going to go ahead and just read that for you. Build an active town center containing a mix of uses, a gridded street system with generous sidewalks, and a series of public gathering and social spaces. The public spaces will be located outside and possibly inside, generally available to the public, framed by buildings to the extent possible, and located and de <clears throat> excuse me, designed to be pedestrian oriented. What Polygon's proposing has buildings on either side and it's very ped oriented. It'll have connections at both the north and the south, which I'll talk a little bit about. And that actually segues into our condition 57, a new proposed condition. As we are working through this, we realized we needed some stronger language to <clears throat> better communicate the two crossings at Ellis and Discovery. And with that, we propose new condition number 57. Private trails, sidewalks, and vehicular routes shall have an easement recorded to the city allowing public access. The easement shall include language regarding the ability to close these routes for private events. However, emergency access, pedestrian access, and reasonable access to individuals shall be maintained. And actually, that also gets at a question that the commission had about whether or not this plaza could be closed for any reason. Um, and because 
this does provide primary public access not only for the residents but for the public that condition is here <clears throat> we had questions about the pedestrian and the bike routes in my last presentation I didn't provide a map I apologize for that so I've taken the opportunity to here to add a map and talk about some prominent destination points that were highlighted by the Commission specifically um, Central Park yeah. Swedish yeah. Hospital Mike yes may I interrupt for a moment please yes. I wrote this down for the end could you go back to the previous slide and help me again on what new condition 57 actually fixed uh, condition 57 was getting at the idea that because this plaza is going to be privately owned that it could potentially be closed indefinitely for a private event so what this condition is getting at is that because this plaza does serve public pedestrian access closing it is wouldn't be allowed and therefore we're requiring an easement that speaks to that okay thank you you're welcome if I could follow up real quick do, do the um, the plazas uh, the one out front of the theater now and the one in what is it 17 B or is it 17 B um, are those public plazas or are those private plazas in terms of ownership mm -hmm. they're private but they have an easement over them okay so they would be treated the same way as this one yeah thank you So getting back to number three, uh, the commission asked for routes to identify to prominent locations, including Central Park, Swedish Hospital. Those were a couple that were identified. I have two maps here. This first one, that actually shows up pretty good. Um, for a ped or a bike person trying to get to Swedish, there's a couple different routes. You could, I'm not going to move the mouse, but you could go down 320, block 24 there, and get over to the ped bridge, which is one option, or you could cross uh, Discovery Drive at the south end of Block 4E there and get over that way. And then secondly, this is more of a macro view. To get to Central Park, um, you could go up 10th Avenue across to Falls Drive and go on the new trail that goes through the wooded area there to the south of the Bellevue College site. Or you could go up Falls Drive and continue up to College Drive over to Central Park. I've also highlighted some other connections. It's, it's a very well connected Great, I think for pet and bike there's multiple opportunities to get around <clears throat> excuse me and this is actually what I was getting out with the last condition about the the crossings at Ellis and Discovery the north and south ends of the plaza uh, making sure that those get constructed correctly and with the intent so we're proposing new condition number 58 Pedestrian crossings approximately in line with the north-south plaza will be provided across both Ellis and Discovery Drives. These crossings will be intuitive, efficient, and safe. Moving on to number four, and again, if you want to follow along in your memo packet, that's perfectly fine. Uh, number four had to do with traffic and circulation. Some questions and concerns came up about how vehicles would get from block 21 to 22 or vice versa. Um, and that these these units might not be accurately identified it could be confusing and then also there was a question about the impact of traffic from this project on the adjacent streets specifically Ellis and Discovery um, from what I've learned working with Dan the traffic volumes for this project are actually less than what was anticipated with the high streets development that didn't happen however the, those streets were constructed for that project so the volumes are applicable and and they meet the the minimum requirement um, with regard to cars going from block 21 to 22 and vice versa uh, we don't propose any change actually we do um, to facilitate that and to help east side fire and rescue pedestrians cars get from one block to another we propose condition 59 which has to do with adding address kiosks around the project to facilitate connectivity and mobility uh, new condition number 59 address kiosks shall be provided to assist drivers and pedestrians in locating residents within the project the applicant shall work with DSD <coughs> and EFNR during the utility and building permit review to determine the location and quantity of address kiosks 
each building shall have its corresponding address kiosk installed prior to temporary certificate of occupancy. Another question that came up about traffic and circulation, should the driveways at both north and south ends of the site be signalized? I think the answer to that is no. Uh, we signalize intersections, we don't signalize driveways, and therefore signals wouldn't really be warranted at this location. Number six, questions about overlooks, and we have these two overlooks at the northwest and southwest site, corners of the site. Um, there was a question that these overlooks might be utilized more so if for a private use and what could be done to make sure that those were active public spaces that were intuitive for pedestrians, people knew how to get to them and, and could be, really be an asset for the public. Um, what we're gonna, what was gonna be done here is a continuation of the paving materials, the surface materials from the plaza should be should be constructed here, as well as wayfinding signage and design elements to try to really indicate that that area is a public space. And we've proposed a new condition to facilitate that, new condition number 60. During construction permit review for the northwest and southwest overlooks, design elements, informational signage, et cetera, shall be incorporated, which indicates that the overlooks are accessible by the public. And this would be implemented through the construction permit review process. Number seven and number eight have to do with home occupations and accessory dwelling units. Um, I'll just jump forward here. I think a 24 of the units within this project have this additional ground level entrance that could be used as the applicant stated as a quote, live workspace. Um, just jumping back to home occupations, just a little bit of background. Home occupations are allowed anywhere in the city. Um, there, there are actually probably a lot of them and we wouldn't really know. This map on the bottom just is a snapshot of ones that I identified in Google Maps that exist in Issaquah Highlands. I suspect most of these are just owner-occupied. Um, a couple of them were photography studios. One of them was a pest control, but it's just small business operations that operate out of the house. Um, if, a, if a home occupation did wanna come in with this project specifically, that process is handled through a business permit that must be obtained through the Development Services Department, and then any un unintended circumstances or consequences like parking or are rectified during that process. With regard to parking, uh, typically it's just the owner, occupant that works there, so they have their required parking space. However, if it is a business that allows customers, they're typically limited to one customer at a time and one car at a time. And again, those kind of get looked at further with the building, with the business license review. Number eight about accessory dwelling units. The question came up whether or not these units that have this additional ground floor entrance could be rented out separately. And the short answer is no. Um, accessory dwelling units are not permitted in Issaquah within multifamily projects. So the city would not permit an ADU with this project. Response number nine questions came up about the driveway length. We have a handful of situations like the photo on the right where some of the driveways are tapered and aren't quite long enough to accommodate two parking stalls. Uh, this hasn't been worked out yet. We've kind of been in some preliminary talks with the, with the applicant to try to figure out how we can accommodate full-size parking spaces. We expect to to hash that out during the construction permit review. Additionally, uh, there's a situation like we see here with block building 23 and 24 where the driveways kind of are shared there and also there's a what looks to be a path joining up with the southwestern overlook. <clears throat> the applicant has stated in their response that they're gonna remove that concrete path there and propose something a little bit more informal, maybe stepping stones. Uh, we're not really trying to highlight that as a primary pedestrian access point, and I will talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, lastly, I would say that the condition or the the driveways will have to be will meet condition 40, which says they must be at least eight feet in depth or more than 18. Number 10 has to do with driveways and pedestrian paths at the four corners of the site. 
there are some units that are served by driveways that link off the alley where there could also be peds that join onto that space to get to the sidewalk. Um, these areas aren't intended to be primary pedestrian parts of the network, so we really don't intend to design these to encourage pet access on them. In fact, during the construction permit review, we'll work with the applicant to try to find ways to not make these primary ped access points so that we don't end up having pedestrians funneling out into the alleys where they're not intended. Numbers 11 and 12 have to do with parking. Uh, the first one, off-site parking. Three questions came up. Uh, first, could on-street parking be on-street parallel parking along 10th Avenue be reserved? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the city, that's public right-of-way parking spaces, and the city would not permit these stalls to be reserved solely for private use by either this project or the Discovery Heights project to the north. Uh, the second one, can parallel parking remain? Or can, currently what exists is you have angled head-in parking on the north side of, sorry, on the south side of 10th Avenue, what currently exists is head-in angled parking. And um, let me just show you that since I'm not confusing you. Um, these, no, that's not going to show it. I guess I don't have a showing of it, but however, they are head and diagonal. Um, the city has two residential street standards that are applicable for a development of this use. And it's really um, up to the applicant to propose a standard that complies with the requirements. And in this case, the applicant has selected the parallel parking on its half of the street, which is allowed per the standard. Um, make sure I hit on all that. Moving forward to parking, getting more at the quantity, I just wanted to, I kind of reworked this table a little bit to provide more clarity. There was a question as to how much parking is located on the street and on site parallel within the alleys versus the driveways and the garages. Um, just to take a step back, the total parking <clears throat> required is 352 spaces. And that's simply the amount of units within the project, 176 multiplied by the two required per, per unit. Uh, in whole, the project is proposing 616 spaces. Most of those are located within the driveway or the garage. Uh, 13 are located within the alley, with an additional 25 located um, on the streets. So those alley spots you're referring to, are they parallel parking within the alley? Yes. Okay. And this was the image that was that I showed at the last present last meeting. The applicant has indicated that they they can rework the site plan to get um, potentially one more space here and one more space here. So there is a possibility to add a couple spaces, parallel spaces along that open space. The question also came up about how wide a car is, and I think that was getting at, are these cars properly fitted for our seven foot wide parallel parking space? And I just looked at a few. We have a Camry at 511, a Miata, comically at 56, and a Ford Explorer, which is a, obviously bigger at six and a half feet wide. Some concern came about the alleys, and because they're serving as the primary vehicular network for these units, how are they going to look? How are they going to feel? A lot of people are going to experience them. They're going to be the primary point of entrance for many of the residents. Um, so there was some concern there. Uh, the landscape standards don't address alleys, nor do the street standards. So we don't really have a lot there to regulate how the alleys look. Um, however, the drawings that the applicant has submitted um, indicate that they will be well landscaped. Uh, we showed a couple images in, in our response memo here. One of them here was this IH Division 42. Uh, the applicant has stated that they intend for their, their alley to function similar to this with trees and shrubs and, and whatnot. Two other questions about alleys. 
Buildings 29 and 30 to appear to have views that look directly down an alley. Will screening be provided? The answer is yes. Per condition 51, we address that. And then is it appropriate to have vehicular circulation served solely by an alley? And I want to look toward a few other projects in Issaquah Highlands that do this. In fact, some of the more successful projects in Issaquah Highlands have this situation where their front fronts out onto a more public open space or a park, as do these. Um, and those, those units are served by alleys. And an example of that would be Division 3, Division 22, Division 95, and the Lakeside Apartments, which I think you all saw recently. I have a question. Yes, sir. Quick. Is there a, any limit to the length of an alley uh, that we have at all as far as just how far can we go with an alley with how many homes? Do we have any sort of standard in that way at all? I don't believe we have a, a limit on how long an alley can be, no. If it was a dead-end alley um, or had only one way in, there would probably be a, a limit, a number limit. Um, I, there's... And the reason I say that, because what Mike said is absolutely correct, but for instance, there's a limit on the length of a cul-de-sac. So if you had a dead-end alley that you know just went down and didn't go anywhere, right. I, I think we would apply the same standard um, that we do for dead-end streets. If that was, if they were again fronting on a open space like this where you don't have a street in front, um, and then the fire department requires. Um, uh, has a limit on the number of homes that can be served with only one entrance. So that, once that you was the, that was okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Can I ask a quick question here too? Uh, um, the Forest Ridge homes, the alleys, uh, do not have landscaping. Uh, is there a reason? Is, do they have too short of driveways or something? What is um, you know, the alley that goes down through the spine of Forest Ridge is unlandscaped. I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, so Forest Ridge is a little different than this situation because it's the alley has single family homes on both sides, and the city doesn't have a role in the landscape on single family lots. That's all governed by the ARC. Um, so the only parts that we would see is where there was that sort of uh, trail that crossed through, and there's, I know there's landscape with that. And I do also don't know if it's been installed. Um, so I think you would have to ask the applicant or the ARC about what happened on the lots. Uh, what I was getting at, I think you answered in that, um, how does this differ? How could we feel confidence that this would have landscaping when that one does not? That's what I meant. Well, and beyond that, um, it might be well landscaped at the beginning, but who's responsible for maintenance? Is somebody going to police that? So if some homeowners don't want to I actually move. have a slide addressing maintenance of of the lots so I'll get to that including shortly. the landscaping in the alley uh, yes okay wrapping up here we've gotten through the meat of them um, number 14 the question was asked about pet waste pickup stations though these aren't required by the city the applicant has agreed to provide them in both open spaces Number 15 has to do with enhancement units. Enhancement units were the residential entitlement that is allotted to this project, and they came from the Park Point Transfer of Development Rights, which provided up to 500 additional residential entitlement units in Issaquah Highlands. Uh, as part of that, and that, that happened under the seventh, development to the seventh Amendment to the Development Agreement, part of that stated that the the enhancement units needed to be of an urban scale, and there was a process with the city council that ultimately defined urban scale as buildings being at least 40 feet in height, but more so they wanted that definition to get at urban density, and therefore they came up with a density minimum for these enhancement units of 20 dwelling units per acre. And this project comes in at 20.75 dwelling units per acre, satisfying the, the minimum density requirement. Number 16, loading right. zones. Just a quick question. Yeah. What was the purpose of an enhancement unit? I mean, I know you define things a bit, but 
Yeah, what's the purpose of an enhancement unit? Is so, it just to meet uh, it, it density? It's, um, it's a fancy name. Uh, so there was, as, as Mike said, there was an amendment to the development agreement, and as part of that amendment, uh, additional residential entitlement was granted by the city, and that residential entitlement, we just call that bucket of units, enhancement units. Okay, thanks. So I'm, I'm and I guess, I guess the other piece is that they wanted them to enhance the urban areas which is why some of the requirements that came along with them. Okay. They didn't want just more single-family homes. Gotcha. Thanks. So when you're talking about 20 uh, per acre, is that buildable land, or does that include open space, parks, plaza, or anything, or is that just a buildable area? I think this is based on the gross. Yeah, this is the, the total area of the site, which is... 8.48 acres, I believe, off the top of my head. And then when you divide that by the amount of units, 176, you get a density of 20.75. Moving on, uh, number 16, loading zones. The application did not propose loading zones, and they are not required per AM Administrative Modification 99003IH. Uh, that AMM states that multifamily projects that have their own driveway for each residential unit and do not have a clubhouse or a manager's office or something of that nature are exempt from having to have loading facilities. It's our expectation that when homes receive a delivery that a delivery truck would park on one side of the alley allowing vehicles to pass along the other side. In worst case scenarios, um, every unit in this in this development uh, has an alternative way out. The, the, the alleys are kind of circuitous in that way. So in the event that the alley was blocked, um, there would be an alternative way out of the, out of the project. Number 17, getting at the maintenance. Um, who will be responsible for the landscape and general maintenance of the community? Uh, I spoke with, with Ben, the applicant, and he indicated that a homeowners association will be established for this project. Um, that's stated here in the memo and then also with regard to maintenance of the plaza the applicant has indicated that the IHCA has accepted the, the tract QV they will take ownership of that and be solely responsible for the maintenance of the plaza tract <clears throat> number 18 mailbox kiosks uh, this came up because there was some concern that given the amount of parking parallel parking in the alleys. We didn't want mail kiosks to, to take up any of that space. So this is something we do typically look at with all of our permit reviews, our construction permit and building permit reviews. But we did go ahead and revise the condition just to provide a little bit more clarity there. Uh, and I'll read number 44 revised <laughs> below. Locate the mail kiosks so the high activity functions are gathered in central areas. The location should be in proximity to roads for USPS mail carriers and should not conflict with parallel parking stalls. <clears throat> Two more, almost done. Number 19, lighting. A uh, few questions. Will the Issaquah Highlands lighting standard be used for street standard, rather? Uh, will the street lighting be pedestrian oriented? At this point in the application, we haven't received information about the lighting. And we've added the, the long condition down here, which I'm not going to read, but it does kind of hit on all those uh, elements that the lighting package needs to have. And the third, the third answer is the city uses a 15-foot standard max height for their light poles to try to achieve a pedestrian lighting scale. Last response has to do with garbage. How will these units, how will garbage service function? Where are the cans going to be stored? Uh, we, ex we anticipate that garbage will be stored in the garages and then placed out within the alley for pickup on pickup days. Because the city maintains, the city is the provider of waste pickup services in Issaquah, um, we do take a look at this with the building permits as well. And we make sure that the garages are, have enough room for two parking stalls as well as the cans. So this is something that we're looking at when we review each building permit. 
So that's a summary of our responses here to the items listed in your memo. I'm happy to take any questions or. Thanks, Mike. Before we get too far into questions, unless there's something urgent, should we go ahead and have the applicant make their statement and then we can combine our questions for them? Okay. Thank you, Mike and staff. Ben. Hi, my name is Ben Rakowski, project manager for Polygon. Nice to be in front of you guys again to uh, answer any questions and provide a little bit more information. I noticed that looking up here at the screen, I don't know if the projector is close to going out or not, but the, uh, the pictures don't quite <laughs> look as good as, they've, uh, as, as we intended, so I hope that you're able to get the, the, uh, the idea of what we're trying to um, portray here. Um, we, the, the new conditions that, um, that Mike went through, um, just want to say we're in support of these uh, these new conditions, and uh, we'll move on to some of the items here. So this is the um, the building that I showed you two weeks ago. This is one of our color schemes, and what I wanted to um, also show is that we are working on a few other schemes. And what I wanted to point out is it won't just be one building type throughout the entire community. We do plan to have um, at least two different color schemes and probably um, work to cluster the buildings, maybe maybe uh, um, a four pack or six pack or some, some type of a way to um, uh, group the buildings with different different color schemes. So we've got, uh, this is another one of the options that we're looking at. and. Um, we have not gone, we, we've had some preliminary discussions with the ARC, but we have not gone through a formal review. So anything that you see here could be changed, but just wanted to point out kind of where we're going with this and, and, and what, our, what our intent is. The other item that I wanted to touch on a little bit is what our uh, vision for the plaza is. Um, You'll see here this is a little bit different than what I presented the last time. The last, uh, the last picture of the plaza had um, two uh, 10 to 12 foot walkways down each side and then the, the middle was open with uh, grass and then the trees planted in the middle. Um, based on kind of what I've heard uh, from you guys, it, it sounded like you wanted to see a little bit more hardscape, something that was a little bit more of a, a social gathering place. So we've decided to um, uh, put hardscape in the entire, uh, the entire width of, of what we're going to build as the plaza. Um, this would be some sort of a, a decorative pavement, something different than what you would just see as a sidewalk. Um, the, uh, a couple other features we would have would be a, a focal point at both ends of the plaza. This is something to signify that this is an open space, something that's kind of inviting for the public to use. Uh, use this uh, plaza throughway. Um, we would provide a variety of seating options. Just a, a few things that we have shown in here would be um, benches, uh, a picnic table, uh, maybe some informal options like uh, some boulders to sit on or maybe some logs, just um, something like that. But we would work with the city to, I guess, uh, come up with a, a design that works for, works for the plaza. Um, other elements we would have would be a bike racks, uh, tra trash enclosures, um, the pedestrian scale lighting, um, and then space for, you know, I guess one of the things we envision this area being used for is, uh, is block parties. Um, we were up at the Forest Ridge site, and I saw that they had the notices up on the, on the mailboxes for their block party, which they were holding in the, uh, in the alley. And when I saw that, I was thinking, well, this would be similar to an alley, but it's, it's kind of meant for that type of thing. And then this is... Uh, it, if it looks a little bit funny, it's because I took an image and I mirrored it back to back. But this kind of creates, <laughs> it's an interesting tree with a hole in the middle. <laughs> I don't know how you get that. But this kind of gives you the feel of what this, um, what this plaza might feel like. Um, the, the plaza that we're proposing probably would have a little bit wider um, uh, pavement section in the middle, probably a little bit less of the, uh, the area in front of the buildings. 
But this just kind of gives you the feel if you were standing down on the plaza looking up the plaza, what you might see. You probably have a few more trees and you know it doesn't have the benches, but kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking at there. Again, here's the, this is the same picture that Mike uh, had up, but um, I guess to answer the question about the, um, the landscaping and how this would be different than Forest Ridge, um, at Forest Ridge, there was not very much space at all next to the driveways. The driveways were, uh, I think, I want to say three or four feet off the alley, and the houses were fairly close together. And on the side of the garages, we had, uh, there were gates. So really, there was, we needed to allow a way for the homeowners to get through the gate and into their yard area. So that's the reason why you don't see pretty much any landscaping back there. It's just we didn't have the room. On this project, we will have the room with the 18 foot long driveways. Um, I anticipate there being anywhere from four to six feet of space in between the driveways to allow for planting. So this is a good representation of what you would see um, out there on the site. Also to answer the question of maintenance, um, Mike did mention that it would be maintained by the HOA um, as would everything on the site. The, um, the HOA would maintain um, all of the private roadways, uh, the landscaping, anything that is, that is within the private property um, of the community, the HOA would maintain. Um, also, on the, on the topic of maintenance, the, um, the High Street Association did say that they would take the maintenance responsibilities of tracked QV as well. Sorry, Ben, again, if you could just repeat that again, the, or let me ask it this way. So if, if this were the case here, something like this, where the driveway and the landscape next to the driveway, that would be the homeowner's responsibility, correct? No, that would be the HOA's responsibility. Well, everything, homeowner, next, even next to the driveway and everything? Absolutely, yep. Okay. The homeowner, since there aren't any lots, it, there's, yeah. it, it's really just all open space. It's all common space. Okay. So everything on the site would be maintained by the HOA. Can, okay. can I ask a quick question? Uh, what responsibility does the HOA have to maintain that, I think once, once they take control from the developer, uh, and then they make their own decisions uh, through a voting. Can they change landscaping or say do away with it because they don't want to pay for it or something like that? Uh, what what kind of guidelines are there to, to maintain it by the HOA? Uh, I'll uh, answer that. That's why we have a site development permit and then a construction permit. So if they were going to propose, say, switching it to all river rock, um, they would have to get the city's approval. And yeah. I would say that that was inconsistent with the permit and the, thing, the basis. I mean, that's the value of your talking. So for instance, if Ben was hit by a truck tomorrow and someone hit his replacement was a river rock fiend and did not like landscape and because you guys have talked so much about landscape it's really clear this is important to you that would not be something that we could casually change it doesn't mean we wouldn't have a discussion with them but uh, it's clear that this is a, one of the critical pieces in your review and decision on the permit Thank you for that. Thank you. So the other thing that I was uh, going to show you is, as we're talking about the alley, so this is the landscaping. And then I, I did want to show you what the backs of the buildings are going to look like, because this isn't going to be your typical uh, building where the back side is kind of what's, what's ignored. Um, as you can see, we've, we've put some detail into the architectural features. Um, we do have the uh, the balconies coming off the back that are that are that actually hang out over the garage. So the garage is recessed a little bit, so the garage isn't the first thing that's that's sticking out from the building. Um, you can see we carried the same roof line that's on the front of the building. We carried that around to the back. Um, in the in the picture, the lower picture, you can see where we've taken the masonry and we've wrapped it around the building. And then in the first couple of units on the end, uh, we also carry that through to the back. So as you drive up to the back of the buildings, it's not going to feel like you're coming up to an alley that you've seen in other places. It'll be, it'll be a different, um, 
a little bit different situation. The other thing here is even though you are driving through the alley, you're also driving past the open spaces. You're driving past the sides of buildings, which are also shown there. So it's not as if you, you're driving down this row of, of garages and that's all you feel. So it is a little bit different situation and I did want to point that out. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer anything for you. Just let me know. Okay, Tim. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, at the general plan, and it looks like, for the most part, you can say that all of these units are pretty much the same in terms of the feel as to how they're situated on their lots and to what you see aspects both alley-wise and front door-wise, with the exceptions of the units that are in buildings uh, 29 and 30 and uh, 6 and 9, where they have the fronts of the buildings are right against the, the adjacent building. There's no, there's no aspect of, of, the, of an open space. That, to me, they use the word claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, the enhancement units has to do with density per acre, and we're right at the ragged edge there. So you've got what I count maybe 10 units that I would say are, eh. Um, I'd hate to think that these things are going to wind up being vacant all the time because nobody would look at them and say, I want to live there, but they're part of the, they're part of the count. Is there anything that can be done to enhance the the environmental feel for that. I mean, I look at it, and the first thing that comes to my mind is you can't you can't dismiss ten units and get rid of them. But uh, if you were to take the adjacent units out the front door, there would be four possible units that you might take out of the picture and say, well, you've enhanced the views from those particular ten units to sacrifice four. Uh, has any thought been given to those? I mean, they're the only ones in the entire place that look like they're out of place. They have a completely different character than all the rest, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, are, are you talking about the, um, I'm going to step away from the microphone here. The right there, yeah. Okay. Those three, the three on the other side on 29, and then on 6 and 9, you've got two that front on the buildings. Right. You know, we're talking about alleys, and what you see in the alley, it might be, hey, compared to being in one of those inner units facing the side of a building, I might like to look down the alley. Mm hmm So. Yeah, it, it's. We've tried to put a little bit of extra, um, I guess, allow for landscaping room there. I, I agree with you. They probably don't have uh, the same view that the, that the units on the, uh, on the west side have looking out over the hill, and they don't have this, the, the same that you would get if you're right on the plaza. Um, but we are aware that those may be a little bit less desirable units, and, and we would like to, that, that's why we've provided a little bit of extra area, so we can put some extra landscaping in on those units, and that's what we've done to try to mitigate for that. Do you have experience with configurations like this as to how they, how they market, how they sell, how they, you know, are, are, are people willing to do that, to live in kind of a cave in a dark hole like that? Yeah, it, it, I don't really see it as being a, a, a dark hole. I mean, it, if it was that situation, two whole buildings back to back, I, 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 I could see it being kind of a dark hole. But, you know, you've got, if you're in the, uh, the, the, the center unit, this unit right here, yeah. you're maybe 40 feet to this open space or probably even less than that, maybe 20, 25 feet. So, the, it's, I, I don't see it as being too much of a, a it's dark not, alley. It's not distance in my mind as, as far as it is visual. Because when you're in the space and you have a 40 foot building that's next door, when you look outside your front window, you don't see anything but the building. The, the other units, like I say, all the rest of the units that I see, they all have a nice aspect from even the ground floor, looking out onto the public spaces and the open spaces, so except for those units. Tim, let me step in just for a minute. There are, for instance, the project that, and, and I, I probably find a picture, but not immediately. Um, the project uh, where we keep showing the alley that they said is typical of that mm -hmm. um, has exactly this configuration. 
and we fretted over that a lot um, at the time that we were reviewing that project and put a lot of conditions on it in terms of space and you know how far apart the buildings had to be and um, and my impression is that those are not up for sale any more than other ones are and that they are um, as well received maybe there's an advantage in terms of price point as um, Ben mentioned um, and uh, overall it hasn't seemed to be the the you know the problem that we were initially concerned about and and that is certainly not the only project that has that configuration it's just and, the one that comes to mind and, that, and that's my concern because I I'm not I'm not familiar with that yeah being but, a single uh, family home for 28 years yeah. it's hard for me to envision that I can so. say I'm familiar quite well with that because my neighborhood is right. exactly like that and they don't seem to have a problem they all sold and they just face each other you know so uh, it's not what I would prefer but uh, there's plenty of people and they don't seem to be priced any different than the other homes just to add a little bit from experience so the picture you were talking about is that the one the units that are just west of the firehouse no um, although that would have been a good one to show too um, this is Concord Commons that is just across 25th from Star Point and it has sort of oh, the yeah. little um, home offices uh, yes. uh, along okay. the street with uh, real estate and piano lessons and yep. things. Okay. And then the, and it's kind of inset, you know, greens and really relies again on the alleys for circulation to almost all the units. All right. Okay. Thank if you. If I could add one thing. Additionally, we have a condition that doesn't specifically highlight the buildings you mentioned, but it does kind of get at this issue. Number 45, and I'll just go ahead and read it. All building facades shall be designed with detail and interest. Blank walls shall be avoided, especially at the pedestrian level. If necessary, articulation or other features will be provided. Appropriate articulation and features could include doors, windows, building articulation, and or other architectural features to create an interesting and varied environment. And, and I think that's an excellent point because when we're looking at the building permits, we're going to be looking at especially in those kind of circumstances when someone's looking right out on it so closely and, and that's a further enhancement than what I've experienced because it's uh, older you know development so it doesn't have the enhanced uh, agreements here so and I did want to put this picture back up just so you can kind of get a visualization of if you're in that unit this is what you would be seeing it's not going to be a blank wall which which does happen in a lot of places so it, it, it would be a little bit, you know, I guess to help mitigate for it, at least it'll be a little bit nicer looking than just a, just a, a, a blank wall there. Okay. Uh, so, Commission, we, we still have testimony from the public. Do we have any questions or comments before we get to that? I just have one question. Okay. It doesn't appear to, do we get a resolution to those uh, driveways that are cut off and, um, it sounds like they're going to still work on that, but they yeah, I mean they're, they are going to work on it. But as I, as I understand it, if they can't get it worked out to be 18 feet, then they will drop them down to eight feet, and and they will meet the condition. Is that and correct? So, so that'll eliminate some parking spots. It would. I think it's um, seven, maybe. The par the parking that I showed in that table, and does not count those. So, for instance, where there's a tapered driveway, I did not count that as a parking spot. That was not counted. So if we're able to get those solved, we'll actually have more parking. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Nina. Uh, just one a question that just occurs to me, and maybe Lucy, this is for you. And um, I really appreciate the design that you've shown, Ben, and the backsides, the attention to backsides, and that uh, that is your intention, but I'm wondering about the document because if it's not you and somebody else is carrying this forward, you know, we may not have as many um, instructions. Yeah. So, Lucy, uh, since the is it true that the alleyways are not pedestrian, and if the alleyways aren't pedestrian, then does articulation and building detail need not apply to the back side of buildings? Uh, so the um, what Ben has shown is part of the public record 
that you're using as the basis for your approval or your decision, not predisposing you to one decision or another. <clears throat> the, and in addition, for the units um, that, uh, you know, there's the sort of linear open space on the east side of the site where um, they are, uh, some of the units are facing the back side across the alley. Um, uh, there is, and, I, and I'm just trying to see um, if this is reflected in a condition, but um, there's an, you know, that's the backside that we would absolutely expect to see in that circumstance in particular. Um, I think that on elsewhere in the site, it would be more at the discretion of the ARC, but I think that, I think that because this has been presented to us here. That is kind of the baseline of what we're expecting. That could be done differently, um, but I don't think that if they came in with completely blank backsides, um, that we would say that was consistent with the um, presentation that they'd made and the information you again used to make your decision. Yes, Chantal. No, go ahead. It's, uh, my question was very similar to Nina, but applied to the, uh, the, the plaza. And uh, the language that's being used that we anticipate that it will include this, 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 you know, seating areas and uh, meeting places and all that. And uh, um, because it says anticipate may include uh, what was the, you know, it sounds like it, you answered it by saying this is part of the record, even though it says anticipate as opposed to, I mean, it's not, it seems a, loose. Can you tell me which condition you're looking at um, just so I can be looking at the language with you? Well, actually, there is no condition. That's, okay. uh, that's page five. Uh, using the plaza guidelines, we anticipate that it would include mm -hmm. Decorative paving, variety of seating, focal yeah. points. If I could, I, uh, I mean, I can summarize this. I think, and that is, there, there's a lot of stuff in this application that says, you know, it's not required, but here's what we're planning to do, or what we're hoping to do, or anticipating to do, um, and then, you know, we're going to make a decision potentially, or we will make a decision at some point, based on this information. But they could theoretically go back and say, well, we don't really have to do that, and so that could be a concern. Is that? Did I summarize that yeah, correctly? So yeah. So what do we do then? Do, do we ask for, con what would be the procedure? And I don't know if this is the right time to, to address no, that. No, that's a good, good question. Um, can, can to I formalize ask, the process. Mm -hmm. Can I ask just for clarification on, from Lucy? Uh, so this is a matter of public record. And I don't know if they could just say, well, you know, we don't have to do that. Uh, they sort of have to answer to you when they do the final, <laughs> right? And you can say, well, that's not really what you showed the, the commission. That's I, not really the intent. You, I mean, you have I, some say I, so? I, we've never ended up in this situation. Right. Um, but if, if we ca it came down to it, what I would, and I have said this, I think, once in 15 years, then let's go back and talk to the commission. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I feel a responsibility to the commitments that have been made as does the applicant, mm -hmm. I'm sure, uh, to the staff reports, the drawings. I mean, we're not saying, it, it's not like you condition every single thing to say, and you'll do this, and you'll do this, and you'll do this, because this is the materials they have presented to say this is the basis for why we feel that we are consistent. So uh, if, if we got to a point where we did not have clarity or agreement on it, then we would, I think, come back to you and say, do you think this met the intent of the approval that you gave? And we're comfortable if Ben's bus headed in your direction <laughs> and knocked Good you out? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's why we videotape. Right, okay. <laughs> Thanks, but Lucy. That's an excellent answer. Actually, so what, what is the role of the ARC in this? And do they have the same records to base their own decisions when when some of those decisions then go to them? Um, no, because we're, we're using different things to uh, review and approve. Mm -hmm. So um, generally speaking, the architecture is theirs. Um, you know, colors, materials, so uh, 
in, in terms of buildings, which is, I think, why Nina was asking right. that question. Um, however, there are circumstances in which the architecture is is part of our approval. So, for instance, the homes that face the back of uh, the the ones across the alley, and they are looking at those and saying, uh, you know, we're going to approve flat fronts. I, you know, we would contact them and say that's in, that's inconsistent, and we can't approve it under those circumstances because it's not consistent with what the um, commission used in their decision. And we have those discussions sometimes. Are you, are you satisfied with that? I, I think so, but I still would like to see at some point a little bit more definition, certainly for the, the plaza. Uh, but that, I think, will come for the discussions after. Yes, we'll have some discussion, yes. Okay. Any other comments before I open the floor to the public? Okay, thank you, Ben. Thank you, staff. At this time, I'd like to open up the public uh, comment portion of the meeting or testimony. or testimony, depending on which part of the agenda you're looking at. So if you'd like to speak, come on up. Looks like we have our first participant. My name is Connie Marsh. I have a store at 1175 Northwest Gilman Boulevard, Suite B11, and I also live in town. And I spent my day trying to get copies of the videos from 2005 and on. And guess what? I can't. I got one. You look, you had so much more hair. This was 2005. <laughs> it was just, just like. It wasn't me. It was somebody. It, it was you. You talked. <laughs> Flo Schaefer was there. Remember Flo? Yeah, it was great. So anyway, but in the middle, just when Judd was getting up to fume over the bridge, because I was trying to get the, east, the preliminary plat for East 42, mm -hmm. the sound went off. I saw him turn purple, sort of in a fuzzy way, which was good, like the, the old times, right? But um, all three of the videos that I was sent were of the same meeting. And uh, that, I and then the sound went out. So by that time, Candy was gone, and I had all of the paperwork from around it, but I didn't have that one. And uh, I probably spent two hours at City Hall today digging around trying to find information, and I got very little. So I was frustrated. So when you say there is a public record, there isn't really. They, we we got a new website. And they dumped all of the history, and so the only way to get the history is to actively call the city and ask for the files, and then you could go, you might be able to get a link, but then you're lucky if the links work. So uh, I don't know how to solve that particular problem because it wasn't a good paperwork day for me. I did learn all kinds of good things, and I did happen to have High Street. And I did get tidbits here and there. I probably read five different things that talked about plazas. And what I gathered from what I could glean, and the reason it sticks in my mind so solidly, is that we were talking about mixed use. We were talking about businesses and houses together. And so when I see by buildings, in none of those conversations where we were talking about these plazas were we talking about an alley of homes, you know, basically a corridor of homes. Now, the language, the very detailed language that was written down does not reflect that, that mixed use. And that is what they're using. They're using this very, this what is precisely on the piece of paper. And so it, um, I disagree. But it says they have total control, and if they agree, then it's all good. And I doubt I'm going to be able to argue too much about it. But in High Street, it was very interesting to see how they splintered out their public areas. And with great detail, they talked about what it was going to contribute to this mosaic of plazas in the social public realm. And the conditions at this point in time were tighter. There's pages of of ideas and thoughts of how the individual areas would look. And now we've reduced that to one line of, well, it would be nice if they did this or this or this, but it doesn't say 
they must. And um, I guess I didn't realize how much it had changed until I went back and read things from 2003 to now all in one day. And uh, it's the burden has gotten way more on the staff's review. So um, when I look at the plaza still, it feels like a private community plaza where the neighborhood is going to be using it rather than all of the highlands and the shoppers being welcomed into it. And I still very much disagree that that was the point of this series of plazas. And I could read endlessly out loud from high streets, but because you all are going to have this piece of paperwork in your closets too, uh, read it and think about it. And then we're going to go to landscaping because frankly, I'm tired of knick in a tree. And that's what's turned into landscaping and a lot of the things that are going in the highlands. And uh, I'm watching them plant dead summer, 90 degrees. They're planting trees in the, in the shopping center. And it's just flipping me out because that's not good. But it also brought the idea that when you're looking over Highlands Drive, it's hot, very exposed, and I think we need to be... Uh, careful in having a balance of shade to sun and also there's nothing about weather protection and if there are plazas it seems like we should have weather protection because nine months out of a year it's raining and you don't even have a hut seems like there should be something um, in that situation so I don't know who says what the landscaping should be and how varied it should be, but I would like to see in all of the things that go through that the landscape palette be described in some way that is more lively than kinnikinnick and trees. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Marsh. Mr. Kepler. Uh, good evening, David Kapler, 255 Southeast Andrews Street. Um, I wasn't, there was response number nine. It talked about trail vehicle conflict. I'm kind of sensitive about that one. And I'm not blaming um, the applicant here for Forest Ridge, where originally there were going to be three houses backing into the multi use trail. There's still going to be two. But um, I don't want to see any, any time that we can avoid sidewalks, trails being in conflict with motor vehicles. Uh, we can we need to avoid that. Um, every every year I spend a, a week in, in Brooklyn where my daughter lives and I'm either on a subway or walking and walk miles and miles and miles in front of uh, uh, brownstones and lots of other things in, in Brooklyn, especially where she lives there. And um, one thing about Brownstones, just because there are six of them in a row, they can be quite different. They, you know, you know that they were all built at the same time. They're just be types of architectural features are repeated and stuff. But they're not necessarily. There can be a lot of variety within, you know, in a street or where that. So, um, you know, if they do some of that, um, I think uh, that would be fine with me. But uh, they'll see what they want to come up with. Um, I, I sent a, an email, I hope you got that, and my concern about a bike, bikeways. And uh, Connie just uh, had a document there on the, um, on that, uh, also that she referred to, and it did talk there about the need for a bike lane uh, connecting, like from Falls Drive to West 43, the, the hospital. And my concern is certainly the plaza being um, not a, a speedway for for bikes, especially <laughs> street bikes can go very fast and very quiet and uh, can be uh, really a safety hazard uh, for over fifty years, my family we've been going to Claylock, uh, the campground over on the ocean there, and it's amazing how the campground still looks the same but uh, um, one big change is the, this time when we were there in the last few days, 
It was just flooded with little kids on bikes. I mean, there were a few people on single speed, smooth tire, fat tire bikes, but uh, in the mountain bikes just stayed on people's bumpers for the most part, but um, on their bike racks. But all over there were little kids and bikes. And I expect in this development, there's gonna be a lot of little kids. And for them to be able to, to ride in the plaza and you know how they're gonna ride, they're gonna be going in circles, loops, and all that kind of stuff. Um, they don't need the high speed bike traffic coming through that plaza. So we want to make sure there is a good bike route for, hopefully, students at Bellevue College who are going to the medical facilities, not just the hospital, but there's going to be a lot more medical facilities on the, associated with the hospital that likely will be part of the, hopefully, part of the instructional program at Bellevue College. So uh, I want to make sure we have a place for the commuter type bikes to get from the eastern part of the Highlands, including Bellevue College, over to the hospital and, and the other employment that will be over there eventually when Microsoft decides to do something. So we don't want those bike corridors being through this pr project. Um, one, I don't know if it was a requirement, but uh, mentioning, Connie mentioned about plants, planting in soils. There is the 12 inch requirement in other parts of the highlands. I hope that is on this one too, in terms of 12 inches of topsoil which is a key to keeping those plants healthy and, and, and being nice and viable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kapler. Is there anybody else that would like to speak during the public comment portion of tonight's meeting? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment at 8.17. Thank you. Okay, any response by staff? Actually, Lucy, the 12-inch topsoil requirement still is in place? So there isn't a 12-inch topsoil requirement at so Isqua Highlands. Place. Okay. Um, however, because it is a, um, especially the development area four um, was a quarry, there is no topsoil left. So if someone doesn't propose some, um, there, there are some bases for, um, requiring that they provide some topsoil, uh, but not uh, specifically 12 inches. Other later development agreements have that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, I think that the concern about the plant palette, um, I'm not a big fan of Kinnikinick either. Uh, it is really an ARC thing, and I, um, as long as it's consistent with the character, I don't get a lot of say in plants. And so it's in something that, especially for those of you who live at Issaquah Highlands, is um, an opportunity for you to converse with the ARC about your expectations and desires, because that's much more in their purview than ours. Yeah, which is interesting that the... You want me, you want me to ask? Je Jeff and I are both wondering, is, it, is this a figure of speech or something we should know? Connect, 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 connect. Kinnikinnick is a, uh, <laughs> it's, a native plant. it's a native plant that um, m many of the planting strips that don't have grass anymore have kinnikinnick because it is very durable and doesn't need a lot of water and doesn't have to be maintained. Yeah, Thanks, native. Native. Thank you. Okay. Well, I was going to say, we Easy. don't really ever have the chance to talk to the ARC. And gee, wouldn't it be nice if, wouldn't it be nice if we could? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a requirement that they came to us once a year or something, or, or every yeah every twenty years or something, just so that we could actually convey our thoughts to them? So maybe we should invite them to the next meeting just to have them here and let them know that we care. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, we can follow up on that, I guess. Um, all right. Meantime. Uh, any response, any further response by staff on any of the comments there? Uh, I'll address a couple of the items. Uh, Mr. Kapler, sorry, I meant to talk about the, quote, high-speed bikeway through the plaza in my presentation, and I skipped over it. But I did hand out your email to all the commissioners for the meeting today. And I think that plaza is really, you had mentioned bicyclists coming down from Bellevue College potentially maybe making their way to Swedish, which be the kind of the route that would possibly include bikes going through the plaza I think I think that the way that'll be designed it'll be more of a slow speed route and if if someone was really concerned with getting somewhere expediently 
it would be quicker and more efficient to take 10th down to discovery. And I just feel like the way that that will be designed, um, I don't anticipate really high speed bikes going through there because it wouldn't be the fastest way to get through the site. Um, Um, to, uh, while, while, um, I, I wanted to just, uh, provide, uh, hopefully some level of comfort to the commissioners about two of the items that you asked about, um, condition 44 requires that the garages across from, um, buildings, um, six and nine, that that backside have architectural treatment, recessed garages, elements overhanging, treatment of garage doors, trellises, you know, so a lot of the things that you saw in that image are captured in condition 44. Um, and then um, condition 53 uh, identifies that uh, the plaza has to have, you know, seating areas, varied materials, street furniture, bike racks, public art, landscape. So it, there was a list of the things that are expected in the plaza. What? That's a condition? Yes, uh, number 53. Okay. Well, Do you get that, Chantel? Okay. Okay. Anything else from staff at this point? Not at this point. All right. Let's go ahead and get into commission discussion. Mr. Lee has a point to make first. Um, so, I think you have to give the applicant a chance to respond oh, to if they want. Yep, you're right. They have I any do. further responses to yeah, further public responses comment? To any of the, no. Okay. Nothing further from the applicant. Thank you, Lucy. I apologize. Um, you certainly will have more time to if. We have questions. Certainly, we're going to bring you back up to answer. So, thank you. Okay, Mr. Lee. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, I'm sort of throwing this out to the commission as we discuss things. Jeff's going to hit things by topic, but frankly, I'm not very excited by what I've seen overall for this development because I see it as very alley centric. Um, I think I counted except for 10 units. Most of their interface will be, if you assume, as seems to be the case in Isqua Highlands, where I live, that most people come in and out through cars. They're going to see nothing but alleys. And there are several conditions where alleys seem to almost give a release from certain conditions or whatnot. I would note, well, we're not going to, we don't have to put signals in because it's a driveway. We don't have to have the same type of landscaping standards because it's alleys. We don't have to have the same type of lighting standards because it's alleys. Architecture. Architectural, visual, it's very alley centric. And that's how a lot of people are going to see. And there's only a few units that are going to get to see the the front of other units. My experience in Esqua Highlands and driving through a lot of Talus is people seem to be car centric. They don't seem to use the front of the brownstone units. There's several places I, I walk by where because people don't see them driving in and out, they actually don't pay much attention to them. It's almost like the minimum is done. So while we're meeting some of the conditions and I do want to hit things by topic, I wanted to throw that out to the commission as we get started because I want some feedback and some dialogue and discussion on what your views are on that topics in general, because I think that added with the plaza and Connie's comments about the plaza and, and it's not really adding to the string of plazas linked together in the sociable public realm. It's very internal. Mm -hmm. I see it as being sort of not extraordinarily well used because of the way a lot of people are. So that's why I wanted to get in front of the specific topic discussion, Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you, Carl. So, um, so I, w I would like to talk I in topics rather than going down the line and everybody sort of putting out their two cents, but we can all jump in on the topic discussions. I will say in response to that, uh, I generally agree with you. I think, I think most people will come in and out when they're going to and from work or to and from school or whatever it is that they're doing. There are times, of course, when they'll, they get home in the evening and they go out and go shopping or go to the movie or whatever and they and they may get a different view if they don't jump in their car but you're right I mean the reality is most people are getting in their cars to go 
elsewhere uh, most of the time. Um, so that's an excellent uh, observation. The topics that I have written down that I think are sort of hot topics, and certainly we can add to that are, and some of these might really be combined, are parking, alleys, bikes, uh, lighting, plaza, and circulation. Certainly landscape can be there too, but I think we've you know, nailed most of that. Certainly you can talk about it if you want. Did I miss a topic that would be interesting to you, Nina? Uh, the definition of urban scale and mixed use as far as uh, the fulfillment of enhancement units uh -huh. uh, enhancement being used for housing. Okay. okay. All right. So um, let's just go ahead and talk about, if you don't mind, the, let's start with with the alleys as the circulation. I, if, I'll, I'll start off with, on, on this document, Mike and Lucy, you guys, on page 8 of 17 here, you talk about, um, this was under the traffic and cir circulation section, you talk about uh, a comparison to 17th and 18th uh, at Katsura and the, you know, the amount of space, 200 feet between them in terms of circulation. Immediately what jumped out at me was these are streets, they're not, they're not alleys. And so I don't even look at this as a, as a comparison. So I'm not quite sure what the comparison is there. So the, there were two topics there. One had to do with um, alleys, and that this was not meant to speak to that. Okay. The piece that this was talking about was a concern that there needed to be additional connection between the uh, Block 21 alleys and the Block 22 alleys. And so this was really just saying that the distance between them and the length of it was similar to other blocks. Right. In terms of circulation. Right. I, I, I understood that part, but I don't see the pun intended connection between the 17th and 18th and the alleys because we're talking about internal circulation through alleys versus streets. So another reference point was uh, the apartments, uh, that everything within that, within the units, uh, everything is sort of back alley kind of stuff. And you can get, you know what I'm talking about, off of Park Drive? There was a, a comparison of... You know, all of these homes being serviced by alleys or, be, you know, these non-public streets. The difference there is everything is reachable within the internal network. And here, not everything is reachable within the internal network. You have but to go out. that's an eight-acre project. And this is an eight-acre project that is, has two separate circulation. Right, and it's all serviced by alleys. I guess I just have an issue with the alleys. My, so so, so the, that's well, the purpose of my question earlier about just how far or how long can an alley be? Because, you know, to me, both an alley and a winter, you know, they, they should be you know, used conservatively and, and for short distances or something to that effect and not as a major kind of transit uh, aspect. Uh, that's, that was what I was getting at as far as how long can we, you know, because we could just have an endless alley, you know. And, and, and then I think we've got clarity where, you know, there's obviously a purpose for an alley in the winter if you start to lose, like, land, uh, lights and things like this. And so that's where yeah, I, 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 have, I share that concern a little bit where you have the, this is a, a huge alleyway. Um, so I, I would share the concern on that, too. Nina? I'm sorry, Lucy, to make you repeat, but back to page 8 of 17, the image of Crofton Springs, my lovely neighborhood mm -hmm. home that I think is so fantastic. The uh, reason for this diagram is to show that a road goes 500 feet from Park Drive to Katsura without what? What's the, what was the reason? What's, what's this comparing to? Um, that there was... That there, there that was the basic block structure. That there, I mean, I realize that there okay. are. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, it, I, if I'm understanding correctly, this is, for one thing, this is not an alley. It's a road. Uh, it's a queuing road, so it's a skinny road, but it's a road. On the left hand side, there are alleys. Uh, one, two. There are about five of them that go into. Uh, what's the first one, the um, Burnstead Homes? I'm not sure that those are alleys. I think those are well, Vooners. Okay, Vooners. And then on the right-hand side, there are either Vooners or alleys that go into the um, into Crofton Springs. And so it's not like it's just one uh, piece of roadway for circulation. There are many things that come off of it. 
just a little different than what we're talking about here. Yeah. Agreed. And I, I'd have some other things, but just to that point. Well, and on, on the fact that, you know, I guess my biggest concern is that it's, it's all alleys, and because I'm going to generalize here, all or most people are going to service their homes, get to, to and from their homes via their cars most of the time. And, you know, when we talk about bicycles, for example, if we talk about kids getting their, riding their bicycles on the plaza, they have to get their bikes from somewhere. Likely they're going to get them from their drive, from their garages, right? Which means they're going to have to go from their garage through the alley out to the plaza, quote unquote plaza. Um, or if they don't happen to live or, or on or near the plaza, they're going to be riding their bikes on the alleys or the sidewalks, right? If we talk about all those little kids, if, you know, I, I guess it's just feeling not quite right to me with, with the alley as the primary, not the primary, the only circulation. You know, the circulation, is, that is vehicular circulation. And we've created the, the, this is a pedestrian priority community. And while people do drive their cars, uh, you know, it's, a, it's two segregated circulation systems. But Lucy, let's talk about reality here. We have 616 parking spaces which theoretically means we're going to have around 1,600 cars there at almost any time, right? No. You will probably have maybe 300 cars if... Okay, even if it's 300, 100 and... How many units are we talking about? 176 units? As much as we'd love it to be pedestrian-oriented, and it is, it's being designed that way, and we want people to use it that way, the reality is they still need to get to dance class down on Front Street or to their school or whatever it is, and people don't always walk. They're, not everybody here is going to work at the movie theater in Swedish. I'm just pretty certain of that. I guess I'm just really concerned that the, that the alleys are the primary way people are going to get in and out. Of, there's, there's no other option. I mean, you talk about walking, but where are they going to walk from? They're going to walk to the grocery store. They're going to walk to the movie theater. They're going to walk to um, a shop and have coffee. Or right, they're but going if, I, if I work at Microsoft or I work at Amazon or I work at you know, wherever, it's, I don't know, I'm not gonna, there, I'm not gonna argue it, I just think reality doesn't support this. The, I like the idea of it, it's just we don't have, you know, like David said, we don't have subways, we don't have, we don't have the pedestrian support network through transit like other cities do. This is the most transit-oriented area. The YWCA survives with one car parking space per unit and has no overflow from that. Different clientele. I completely I completely agree with that. Yeah. But you, you've got three to four parking stalls for each of these okay. units. Let's talk so, about let's talk about the, the units that are uh, east of YWCA, mm -hmm. the condo units. Mm -hmm. I know many people that live in there. Mm -hmm. Most of them that I know. In fact, all that I know, and I would say most that I've seen, do not walk over to the park and ride and go off to work. Some do, but most of them have to take their children to daycare or school. They have to go to their job somewhere. They have to Now, granted, they have to shop somewhere, and now they, maybe they can shop at Safeway, but if they've got 12 bags of groceries and kids in car seats, they're not walking down there to do that. They still may take their car and, and, and do that. I guess I'm just saying that I love the idea of it. I just don't think it's fully supported outside of the realm of this. How many acres? Eight acres that we're talking about. So this is one of many projects. So it's the person that buys here, just like the Z Home. Z Home had one parking stall per unit, all alley served. Um, you know, they're not every, not everyone would choose to live in that circumstances, but they understood what they were buying into. Mm -hmm. and, and second of all, there are maybe four or five other projects um, that I can think of. For instance, the Crofton Spring, not where um, you live, Nina, but the one over by the Village Green has no alleys, no internal vehicular circulation at all. It's completely served from the outside and people walk in. I mean, I guess that there are other, there are a variety of choices that um, are provided for different preferences. 
Right, but they walk in, correct me if I'm wrong, they walk in after parking their car on the street, right? So they're still driving to their home. Right, I, I, but I, I don't understand why that, they are, but they are not parking on the street. Most of the parking is off the alley for that project. Um, and the lakeside permit that you reviewed recently was almost all alley served. Division 95 was all alley and or Vunerf served with almost all the circulation on the interior. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, there are other projects that I can identify that are set up that way. We don't design all of the projects that way. At this scale, though? Are there any of them at this scale? Um, I think Lakeside was bigger than this. Which Lakeside are we referring to? The uh, Polygon project that was reviewed just before this permit. I think yeah. that one was 10 acres, 12, 13 acres? It's totally different, yeah. yeah. This, uh, let's let's yeah. add, uh, I want to come back to Carl's just to add to the discussion that it's not just about uh, cars driving on the roads, but what, defining them as alleys, the other situations that it brings. And we can continue to this discussion, but I thought Carl's point to the, the fact that it's alleys, uh, some have identified, Stephanie brought it up at the last meeting, how calling them driveways then presents a situation on Ellis and Discovery where where we have identified what we think might be inadequate uh, infrastructure to serve 176 homes in here. When we talk about um, the comparison, it's great that the comparison to Crofton Springs is good and it's bad. Um, the good thing is that, you know, this is about the same amount of homes. There are a little over 100 homes in Crofton Springs and then across the street in the terraces and then the townhouse community whose name is escaping me. Um, if you put those things together, it's about like this. But we have streets. Now, there, for some reason, streets was the right answer. Now, because we have streets is perhaps why we have left turn lanes off a of park to get into them. These are driveways, so they're not getting that kind of attention that 17th and 18th get. So is it, is it a left turn lane that you're concerned? No, don't try to, I don't want to minimize it to one thing. We're, the, um, uh, especially on the north side where there is a major road coming onto Ellis with two driveways coming out of this community, we feel that they're, I think, I'm not, I'll say it's just me, uh, that they're, is a traffic situation there that's not being adequately addressed, and perhaps it's because these are alleys rather than streets. Even if they were streets, they would not be signalized. They wouldn't meet I the warrant. I mean that they might not signalized as one end of the spectrum of addressing uh, a uh, traffic um, warrant, but even stop signs or some other kind of management doesn't need to be signalized. Just saying. Crosswalks. Crosswalks. There is going to be pedestrian, there is a condition for that. Anyway, it's not just the size of the roads or where the kids play. There are a lot of things that seem to be coming off this issue of these being alleys, and if there was another approach, then perhaps many things would be. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things I'm concerned about is, you know, I, I want it landscaped. I want to see it landscaped so it looks pretty because I think most people will be going through there. But I worry about that, too, because it's people, there will be lots of pedestrian traffic back in those alleys because people are getting in and out of their cars. It's a primary way to get in and out of their house. And if kids are, you know, pulling their bikes out and riding, they're probably riding in the back and not running all the way around to the front. You know what I mean? And, and so visibility is a concern for me. So I don't know how to balance that exactly, but it is a concern. And I, um, the, to Carl's point, the people, and two years too, people do use the alleys for playgrounds, and I think it's great. I see the kids outside my window here, and they have yeah, so much fun out there. But then if you talk to somebody from Dahlia Park, they're saying, what are these kids doing playing in the alley? I'm, I'm, it puts me at risk of hurting them when they shouldn't be playing in the alley. So it's a can of worms, I guess, for some people. So I want to make sure I understand the commission's concerns. So it's, are you saying that you think that this I'm not sure what you're asking for. I mean, I hear, I hear concerns and I'm trying to figure out which ones are ones that we have a basis for making a change. So um, if the concern is, is there going to be landscape in the alleys, I think we can address that. If the concern is um, 
making sure, I mean, you know, you could even frame it that um, people backing out of driveways and garages and sight lines to cars ad addresses many of the same concerns that you would have if you had pedestrians in the alleys. And there's a fairly standard condition that we use for booners um, that we could use in this circumstance. If the issue is lighting, um, we can talk about what that condition is to make sure that there is sufficient light in the alleys relative to vehicular circulation. Um, if, if the concern is that um, this, these should be streets, I'm not sure that we have a basis for changing the whole plan from alleys to streets because the there are two separate circulation systems. That may not be your preference, but I don't know that we have a basis for saying that those two, that, that you must have your pedestrian circulation with a street and not two segregated uh, a vehicular circulation and a pedestrian circulation. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm trying to answer all your questions. I'm trying to make sure I understand your concerns so that I can identify where we have a basis for poten potentially changing our added conditions and where we don't. So my first pass at a response to your questions would be yes of the things that you said because they're the things that I talked about. So lighting would be one. If you treat everything in there as an alley, and I'm thinking of an alley similar behind Ashland Park. I'm sorry, I don't know all the division and, and road names. But if you go back there, that's an alley. And if that were the face of, an, of a development, that is not what Isqua Highlands has been designed for. That's been designed for access into those homes, but that's not the front face of the community or of a specific development. I think that would be very underwhelming if that's what we were looking at. So when you take all of those in total together, it's not one single thing. I'll fix the lighting and everything's okay. But when you say that the alley is a primary, the only circulation for vehicular traffic. I like that the pedestrian vehicular traffic is separate. That's great, but that's still saying that the majority of people coming in and out are going to be using these alleys. That's going to be the, the face, the presence of the community. Now, it can affect their property values because it's not as attractive, whatever. Maybe that's the design point, but I just don't think it's going to be the same type of development it could be because things are treated as alleys. So if you go and say, Yes, it's still an alley, but it has to have lighting standards that approach what street lighting standards would be, and it has to have landscape standards closer to what streetscapes would be, because, again, that is the, the face of the community, then I would take them in total, and that's what we're looking at. I don't know if I helped answer or, or muddy, but... So, yeah, I, I, got, I thought I knew where you were going, and then I got lost at the end. That's okay. So, um, are you saying that if it had greater clarity and predictability around lighting and landscape, that this approach would be um, more acceptable to you or that you are just, um, that, I guess the thing that's confusing me, Carl, that you're saying is that you're, you're inherently saying that, that the only way that we experience things is from a car and therefore if the car circulation is not appealing to you, you assume that it is a detriment to that community. And I'm not sure that... Um, yeah, I don't think he said the only way. I think, I, I, I actually think he articulated it quite well. And he used Ashland Park as an example where there was a lot of discussion. This was very, very early on, early on and I, I know you remember this, is we spent a lot of time talking about that Vunerf in front of those homes because we knew the backs weren't the primary point. Now. I'm looking at this saying, okay, let's pretend that, yeah, everybody's going to drive in through the alleys and that's going to be their primary, everyone who lives there, that's going to be their primary most of the time, what they're going to see going in and out of their homes, okay, the reality is people get in their cars and leave. This may be more attractive to those who do not live there and happen to be walking through or choose to walk through. And on that point, I'll state that because this is at the terminus of of the commercial center, of the retail center, I, I have mixed feelings about this whole plaza thing because I, I want to go back to what the plaza was intended for. 
but I'm just I'm just saying that I don't think it's going to be necessarily a through point for the retail center for anyone other than those that live at Discovery Heights and maybe coming from from Swedish, et cetera. But I guess the point is that's going to look beautiful to them. But I think if you're if you're trying to, if you're living there, Carl's points are exactly right, and I think it's a it's a matter of safety, it's a matter of of aesthetics, it's a matter of uh, convenience. You know, alleys aren't just, they're just not drivable like streets are. The parking isn't the same. I mean, all of those things just come into play. Yeah, I hope more people are like I will be. I will use that plaza to go to Safeway. It's a bunch of right angles. Something's got to be, you, you know, geometry just works. You got to go somewhere and take left turns. That's when I'll come down to go to Safeway from my house. So some people will use it, but not that many people will. They'll go around. They won't. It's yeah. way out of your way. No, it's not. <laughs> Do, would it help to see the other projects that have been alley served with segregated separate pedestrian facilities i mean this this is something that is relatively common this feels very different than those though i think There's, it's the the, the Chant size chantel of has something to say she's been waiting <laughs> patiently go ahead chantel yeah so actually i wanted to offer the counterpoint to that i personally don't have a major issue with um alleys that uh, we use them throughout is Aqua Highlands. I realize that there's probably more houses served by that here than elsewhere, but also to the point that you were making is that this whole community is built uh, with the idea of making more walkable. I don't drive. I have a car that stays in a garage. I walk to the park and ride. I'm further from the park and ride than those people will be with a bus stop just down the street there at Ellis and uh, Highland Drives with a grocery store across the street with all the amenities right around the corner. What puzzles me about that, though, is that I would love to see this being marketed and pushed as a walkable community, but then why the four parking Per house, I mean that's en encouraging people with cars to move in, while at the same time trying to prom well, not promoting, but assuming that this will be a more walkable community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie. I was going to say, I don't live up in the Highlands, but to me this looks very similar to a lot of projects in the Highlands that are, you know, very close together, served off the alleyway, and. I think a lot of the projects that we've worked on up until now have been a little bit feeling more suburban than urban. And I think this being so close to all of the retail is feeling a little bit more urban. And like she was saying, you know, more walking, less cars. You know, the people that are going to choose to be right next to major retail like that are probably going to be more people that walk more and people that maybe that don't even own a car because they're going to be close to other things. So I think marketing it that way is a good idea. And I think it's very much, you know, I have my concerns about the project, but I think it's very much in line with what's been done already in the Highlands, and I think it's appropriate for where it's going to be. Thank you. Eric, did you have something? No, I, I just think it's the scale of this compared to what we've seen before. Uh, that, that's just what grabs me, and, and I may have trouble visualizing, you know, as far as, even though I've seen the, the lot and so forth, you know, visualizing the size when it's finally built out, you know, we may all look at it and go, well, I don't know what our concern was. Or go like, wow, yeah, that's what our concern was. Uh, I think it's the scale, you know, of just all alleys and to the extent of the alleys. And that's, that's why I asked the question earlier. Uh, not that I, I think these will sell just absolutely fine. If that's a concern we're having, I don't think that would be a problem. But um, Eric, how does it, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, you in particular live in a project that is not dissimilar to this. I mean, there's a street on one side. Oh, yeah, we're alley. That's it. <laughs> you know, and we have kids that play in the alley and everything. And, and um, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of narrow, uh, not narrow, but shorter. So you don't have any, you know, ability to speed through there. You know, everybody comes in, it's a little bit slow. But, um, I mean, they've all sold. They have no problem doing that. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't think it's going to be a problem it's, to sell it's it. Not the extent. Yeah, yeah. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Like the brownstones are nice. Right. I guess my issue with the alleys is that it's the totality of it. There, there are. I mean, there are major streets and commercial around it, and I just don't. I just. It just feels. And maybe I'm wrong. I could be 100 percent wrong, but it just feels. They're just much too long, and it's everything there that doesn't feel like there's a. 
an out, if you if you know what I mean. It just it feels very enclosed, and you have alleys to go both directions and pulling in and out of out of driveways and, and garages and so forth. I don't I, know. It just I don't know what the, I don't know what the scale was in that picture that we saw of the landscaped alley, but the first thing that I imagined when I saw this plan was in conjunction with the 40-foot building height. I looked at canyons, canyons of, of houses, not very people friendly, but in terms of number of parking units per dwelling unit relative to the highlands, this is much better, more, much, you know, answers some of the concerns that were raised about the highlands and the lack of parking. Uh, I, think, I think this is fine, and what it does have is it's got two entirely different characters depending on where you are. If you're in the alleyway, you see something entirely different than when you're out in front of any of the public spaces. And I, I don't really have a problem with that per se. It just seemed like there was uh, two distinct characteristics of the entire area. When you talk about brownstones in Brooklyn, one of the features of those is not only do you have the brownstone face that, sh that is on the public side, but you have a street right down the middle of it. So you have everything. You have pedestrians, you have automobiles, and quite frankly, my I've been to Brooklyn one time when I was very, very young. I don't think you really want to go in those alleys. <laughs> so these are <laughs> these are a lot nicer than this. You know, I mean, th this is a lot nicer, and I can certainly see as a kid, I can see kids using those alleys on a regular basis as play areas. Um, adults, maybe not so much. But it's a distinct characteristic. You've got a front of your home and you have a back of your home. And never the twain shall meet, especially with some of these units that are six units long. It's like there's no way to get there except through the garage. And uh, then you get out to this hardscape with a little bit of interspersing vegetation. And, you know, why would you do that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Get in the car and go. Get out of there. Yeah. So Thanks. as a pedestrian unit, uh, accessible to shopping and whatnot, I would say, yeah, I'd, I'd probably want to spend most of my time at the front of the house. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. So I'd like to respond. We, we cut you off when you were making an offer. Essentially, would you, if you could show us comparables, something that's this, this scale with, with nothing but alleys, would, would love to see that as a comparison to understand. I mean, well, I, 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 I don't know, know if I Stephanie's point, I lived across from an alley. It, it was a wonderful area, but it was short and it was fed by street. So I think part of it goes back to that totality. I, I think it's a great idea. It's just is the primary piece is what's got me. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know that there is something exactly, um, let's see if I can get in into this. Jeff, can I jump in while she's looking? Uh, kind of summarizing, we're talking about so many different things, and to distill it to uh, solutions that I think might be available in looking at the alley definition is that one thing is is that uh, Issaquah Highlands has a more enforceable um, aesthetic on the street because the street. Um, so when we talk about trusting the arc to fulfill something, it's much stricter on the street side and we would have a lot more um, implementation of the, the vision that we hope for. Something other than alleys would give us that kind of uh, support. And then the other thing is that I still, I'm not quite convinced, maybe I just need to hear from Dan, I'm not convinced about the driveway access on Ellis with the major intersection bisecting it when they're uh, driveways. I also think that there's a solution that does not reduce the number of housing units. I'm not afraid of the density. In fact, if there were more, I wouldn't mind. That's not where, where I'm heading. I yeah. just have a couple things here that might be solved by this one key um, uh, issue that I thought was brilliant. Yeah, I'm with you too on the density. I mean, as Carl pointed out, just because they're called alleys doesn't mean people drive like they're alleys. And, and just given that they're so long and so pervasive, I'm just concerned about, you know, not only the, in when you talk about the term enforcement, I really shudder to understand the enforcement of parking out there when people, because people will pull their cars in and, and leave them there. Well, I'm not even going to get into what I experienced don't, yesterday. Don't but, I, I mean, if, I, if we even think for one second that Isquah police are going to go back in those 
alleys to enforce anything, we're out of our freaking minds. It's not going to happen. So they're not public. So they're not going to. They wouldn't so then, be. So then we should not have this discussion because well, it's you, it's going to be completely ridiculous for for people who live there. I mean, it's ridiculous right now for me on my street that is patrolled by Issaquah police, and they won't enforce what's right in front of their noses. How are we going to get it done in an alleyway? It's, I'm sorry, it's just not happening. I just wanted to respond to Nina's um, question about the access being driveway cuts instead of intersection cuts. The park and ride with 1,000 cars has two driveway cuts. We're putting 500 cars at peak hour out onto that road. That's a safe situation. They do that every day. That, that situation meets traffic warrants. This is a more lightly loaded situation than that is. There's fewer cars on cars on the main road. There's fewer cars coming in and out of the driveways. The driveways are actually good traffic calmers. There is an implied stop at a driveway with an intersection. Sometimes you put in a, a stop sign. In either situation, though, you would have the same traffic control. You have to stop if you're making the movement out of the block into the thoroughfare or into the main road, whether there's a stop sign there or not is a technicality really at that point. If these were roadway intersections instead of driveway cuts, they would not warrant inter or signals. So we, we couldn't put a signal in. My point being we have, I think, the same movement and the same safety situation with driveway cuts potentially better than we do with uh, intersections. And we have a fairly strong precedent that with this volume and turnover, this is a safe environment for entering and exiting. I, I appreciate that point, Dan. That's a, a very good comparison to the park and ride. So that adds a lot of clarity for me. Thank you. I also wanted to add, because we keep talking about turning left onto Ellis, that we can also turn right onto Discovery Drive. People coming out would turn right Probably if they're going to the freeway, they'll go uh, south to Discovery Drive and then turn right onto the, you know, to get to the freeway or to get to the hospital. Or right. It'll depend on where you live in the right, yeah. in the community, yeah. right? Well, either way, you'd have the option of going. Right, but right, if you live if, going, if you live further north and you have to drive the alleyway all the way around, yeah, you're likely yeah. not but going to do two, that. This, yeah, I, I think what there. Chantal is trying to say, if I may, uh, is that. The reason that we design an interconnected street network is so people have choices. If mm -hmm. you're not comfortable making the left turn out, you can go to the south. Or you could make a right and go all the way around the block if that made you more comfortable. If right. that's annoying, you're not going to make that choice. Um, and so uh, I, think, I, I think that's part of the reason that you want those things to be connected so that there are choices. So you can show okay. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not jumping too fast. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be kind of jumping around. I'm trying to look at a couple of different circumstances. Oh, thanks. Keep just turning like the middle ones, I think spotlights and indirects. Does that help? Um, so this is um, 15th and Park. Um, this is one of the early projects. Um, this is not quite an alley, but it's a super narrow street. They have had, um, they, would, they would join in the Jeff I Hate On Street Parking um, Club and um, had to make some adjustments after this. This is about 300 plus feet long. Uh, those blocks are maybe 500 feet long so that when you're looking at um, this, you go back to that. I don't, I don't know that I know what you're referring to. Okay. Right. Huckleberry Circle. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm not always good with the names. Um, you're absolutely right. So from this end to this end is 300 plus feet. And if you're looking at this, um, from street to street, it's about 500 feet. Um, the loop is probably closer to, you know, from here to here would be more like 400 feet. I'm guessing. I haven't measured it. So, so Lucy, that's one that somewhat reinforces one of my concerns, sorry, that it's, it's not alleys facing alleys because the units inside the circle essentially just walked through there yesterday or Saturday. Only, only half of that alley has garages. The other halves are units, so that you're, you're getting that mixed use. Right. It's not the Tim's Canyon of alleys, I guess, right? So um, uh, 
I, I, I may not have perfect examples. So um, I, that was one of the ones I That's could, why I'm going to keep arguing with you. I know. <laughs> Isn't it fun? No. Um, so I'm, I'm piecing together a couple of different examples um, because I may not have the perfect uh, corollary. Um, in terms of, there's some single family ones that are not as, um, so uh, this whole neighborhood, I don't know what this one's called, but it, it's called Division 22 to me. The terraces. Terrace. Yep. So um, admittedly, these are single family homes, um, but for uh, each of these are grouped around uh, an alley with a central green space that has, you know, six to six or seven homes uh, facing onto that space. So it's alley to alley, face to face across a green. Um, um, I don't know if I, oh, let's see. So uh, likewise, uh, I don't know what this project, this is Division 86 and 87 um, and 34. Uh, these again have garage to garage greens, uh, garage to garage. Um, I'm going to guess, uh, this does have a street here, um, which is different than the configuration we were looking at, but these, I would guess, are um, three, 350 length blocks, um, but it does have the intermediary street. Um, and then I think the other example would be um, the lakeside apartments, which had two relatively short stretches of street with a more com uh, uh, significantly relying on alleys and a separate w uh, walkway system. Yeah, I mean, I guess I appreciate this, but I still it doesn't feel right to me because every one of these examples are 150 feet shorter they were not intended to be the primary uh, yes it's primary access to and from their garages but there were streets on on one side or more sides of them uh, the apartment complex in Lakeside is an apartment complex and I kind of fully expect an internal network for apartment complexes not for a I guess it's just for me it just doesn't feel quite right and for the record I don't hate on-street parking I actually appreciate on-street on -street parking. I hate people who are parking challenged, and I hate when people park illegally and nobody does anything about it. I just want to be very clear about that. Um, but um, the so scale I, I, of this is what's, that's what's still getting under my skin, and I, I can't, I wish I could say I have the answers for you. I don't. It just doesn't, doesn't feel right to me. Because so, it's all alleys. We've got no Vooners, no roads. Um, you have, no, I would guess, I'm going to estimate here, that a third of the units are facing streets. Well, facing Highlands Drive. That's, you know, Jeff, you are picking every, you are just a No, no, no. I, I'm saying, look, if I'm a UPS driver, if, if, I guess I'm just thinking even my street is just, it's 20 homes and it's a, it's a cul-de-sac. There are cars that come through there, vehicles, not just cars, vehicles of all sorts, whether they're mail trucks or UPS or visitors or whatever. I mean, I, you know, and they're, they come through those roads and I just shudder to think all of those people going through the alleys all the time, every single day, and how safe that's going to be. If you're coming around the drive aisle, if I'm looking at the lower left corner, and you, you come in from Discovery and you make a left on that drive aisle and you're cruising around that corner there, I just anticipate that, that it's going to be a, a busy location and I just worry that it's just alley, it's just alley standards. I guess. So an alley is 18 feet wide mm -hmm. and a road is 18 yeah. feet wide. So I, I'm, I'm unclear why an alley for the vehicular circulation mm, is different. Okay. I'm sorry that you think I'm arguing with you. I'm not arguing no, with you. I'm, I just I, don't I'm, feel right about it, and I'm sorry that I'm not, uh, I'm not living up to everybody's expectation to, uh, to 
agree with you, but it's just not feeling right to me, and I can't explain it. So I'll and leave that, it at And that. that's the part that I'm trying to get at, Jeff. It's not, I don't feel like you're arguing with me. What I'm trying to understand is the pieces that are not feeling right to you, and whether those are personal preferences or things that we have the ability to regulate. Look, and I've lived here for 15 years, and I'm experiencing everything from shitty parking to people driving too fast on these narrow roads to uh, children playing in the streets, which is great, and I, I encourage that, and my, my kids have done it. To all of these different things, in totality, this doesn't feel right to me because alleys aren't regulated and managed and handled like streets are. That's what doesn't feel right to me. So it's not personal preference, it's personal experience. And it just doesn't feel safe and right and aesthetically pleasing and so forth to me. When, when you talk about, every, you know, if you, if you live in those middle units, how many times you're gonna have to go in and out on that alley around those corners and park there and drive down these canyons and so on and so forth, it just doesn't feel right to me. I think the brownstones are beautiful. I think the plaza is worth discussing. I think you know there's a lot of great things about this. I'm my biggest concern is uh, are these alleys. That's just that's So if we look at at this alley which they think is somewhat similar uh It's much shorter though. That's not 500 feet. So um if And by the way, 500 feet you're talking from Ellis to Discovery, how long is it um around the loop? When we're talking a straight line 500 feet, what's that entire, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's long. You have no way, no way out. If there's, a, if there's a truck unloading stuff, maybe, right? But I'm just saying, I don't know. I, I don't know. And guys, this is not about me. I'm just, I'm just telling you. You're asking me why. I'm telling you why. And, and you know, I may be wrong. And, and, and maybe I am. So, I mean... A little bit of emotion going on here, but um, but you're properly trying to tease out this discomfort we have, and that's fine. I appreciate that. Something you just said made me wonder if maybe that's a, a clue to addressing. You said, well, streets are 18. These are 18. So then I go, well, then why isn't it a street? So what, what are we giving up by calling it an alley? And maybe that's part of my discomfort. Maybe I don't understand the complete implications of what it means to be an alley versus a street. And if you said, well, it's everything is the same, you'll have just what you have on a street, but they're painted blue instead of gray, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. But I, I think that's maybe part of it is the lack of knowledge we have on what the differentiation is between the two. Well, okay. you're giving up a sidewalk, right? So and a curve. We, okay, um, that's helpful. So let, let me describe that and see if this helps. Um, so your curb to curb width, if there was no on street parking, or even if there is, where, where that is located um, on the alleys would be the same. So curb, curb to curb is 18 feet, or edge of paving to edge of paving is 18 feet, and you get an extra seven feet if you have on-street parking. Um, if you, uh, you're not missing a sidewalk, it's in a different location. So it, we've created two separate systems. That, that's one of the issues. This, those are not co-located. Um, so the, um, and I, and I'm, I'm curious about this cause I know that, uh, well, so then you, you do have the garages and you have the driveways. So in terms of, um, streets where you have, um, garage loaded streets, um, generally speaking, that's going to be pretty similar. Um, you're going to have, you know, face of building to face of building uh, and driveway lengths and curb to curb. Maybe a Voonerf would be the comparison uh, because you wouldn't have the sidewalk. You would have just the 18 feet of paving. Now, we're saying in this instance that the 18 feet of paving is just for cars and that it isn't designed um, as a pedestrian system. Uh, if this was if this was concrete um, I mean I'm so I'm okay I'm trying to tease out my thoughts as well uh, yeah um, absolutely 
So if we think about uh, if these were all VUNRFs, uh, mostly what we would be looking for, I mean, I wouldn't love this because it's all garages on the ground floor, but let's say we were okay with that and we were going to do VUNRFs. Uh, I think the difference would be that we would have doors facing onto this, um, but in terms of the building design, the elements that they're showing on the back of the units and which we conditioned for that um, linear park on this side uh, would be the ones that they're identifying. And it's kind of like, uh, think about it this way, with, um, uh, let me think about where I am, uh, Devco, their very first project which you looked at, it is designed as a street, but it is kind of an unusual, let's see, I'm getting lost now. Um, I know I'm trying. I'm just having trouble telling which way it's, it, the, I'm scaring the computer. doesn't like when you do that. So this 10th um, place that's coming in, it has kind of a similar character in the sense that, uh, and I'm going to guess this is about 500 feet long, uh, maybe 600 feet long, uh, especially this segment here. We have a uh, we have a sidewalk and a planting strip on this side for the full length, but on this side um, it has the uh, garage, a very similar kind of building design in terms of a higher level of detail on the garage doors, over, uh, spaces and um, decks and um, pop-outs and things that overhang to try and compensate for, for uh, the garages. And the pedestrian system is on this side. So uh, in that sense, it's kind of a similar, uh, from an experience perspective. Did we get the question answered <laughs> of I road versus alley? I mean, so I, I think that the, the paving lunar. width, the paving width is the same. The um, building relationship might be the same uh, in terms of where the buildings are, height of buildings, driveways. The um, primary difference, it would be most similar to a Vooner. And the primary difference to a street would be that the pedestrian system is separated from the vehicular system. What's that? Uh, the building design standards are different on the street. Yeah. I don't know that that's, that's true, given that they've made this commitment about the backside. And I guess maybe that's some of the devil in the details of those things where there are a few things well we're not you know as i mentioned in sort of my opening statement if you will well we're not we don't have to do that because it's an alley signaling we don't have to do that because it's an alley lighting we don't have to do that because it's an alley landscaping maybe coming back and then comparing what those building backs of building standards would be compared to if they were fronts are they meeting conditions and intensive conditions as if it were a street scape. So am I saying that properly? So most of that is not in your or my purview. Okay. So that's also why I'm asking these questions because right. I know there's things I can't vote no because I don't right. like it. That's not <laughs> right. really my right. place. So I th I think um, 
in terms of the lighting, I would need to take a look at the con lighting condition. I haven't looked at it relative to the question you're asking and whether there's language that we might want to add there. Um, with regard to the landscape, uh, they have shown landscape. There is, uh, land, and I know you're not going to like this, but I'm, this is what I can say, is there's an implication that there's landscape. Garages are required to set back a certain distance from the alley edge. Part of that is functionality, but part of that is also character. And so I think that um, while there is the Forest Ridge example, that is single family lots. And that is different than what has been both presented here and uh, the city's purview in terms of the uh, landscape in alleys. I guess that's the only way I can say it. Uh, so I was just going to add, as far as I think uh, one problem I have, you know, the vision of an alley is really sterile. Uh, in this case, they've addressed uh, that to a large extent by the way the garages, you know, the, the making of the garages and so forth. So I, I think with all the enhancements that they're doing here, it, it minimizes that sterile look that, 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 that I would be concerned about. And then it's just the, the enormity. I think in future projects, this would sort of be a limit to, at least for my comfort, you know, but not necessarily for this project. I think with the enhancements, uh, it certainly makes it much more uh, attractive. So that's just my input. Thank you. Let's talk about the plaza. So I'll just I'll just state that, as I stated earlier, the um, I don't think this meets the original intent of the string of plazas that we talked about. But I have less of an issue with it because I don't believe that this is going to be, I think people are going to use it and I think it's going to be beautiful. I just don't think it's going to be a central gathering place for the larger community as much it will, as it will be for those who live very close to it. Um, people may go from the retail center out to Swedish and back and so forth and it will be usable and so forth and that will be great. I just don't, I just don't see it as being a part of the larger community and plaza usage as we're going to see on 17B and what is it 17 or 7 or whatever. 7 and 17B. 7 and 17B. Um, so I, I, I guess my statement is that I don't think it meets the intent. I don't think it's the plaza that we were looking for, but given this particular setup, I don't think it's unreasonable or out of line. That's just my opinion. It's, I think it's a beautiful plaza for the setting that it's in. The original intent, I think, was entirely different. Not, you know, this is 100% residential, primary, uh, and so I don't think the uh, original intent was to be that. It was more social. Uh, I, I think these people would be irritated if, you know, tons of people came from outside just to enjoy their plaza. To be honest with you, but thanks. Well, I guess my point is that if I tried to. You know, sort of. If I tried to force, or we tried to force, a some a different kind of plaza, it, I don't think it makes sense. I think we'd be I just concur. trying to to go back to some other discussion or decision that was made earlier with a different set of circumstances I around agree. it. Yeah. Chantel. Again, I, to me, the plaza is the asset to the community as opposed to the rest of the development, which will probably be reflected with a price point. You know, for the whatever they can sell, the market will kind of push one way or the other. But the the, the plaza itself, I walk that way quite often. It's a major way for anybody who lives north of there to go to link to the the the, the bridge to go walk around the hospital and down. You know, in the lower areas there. So I think it's a pretty important uh, communication link. And I also think that it does, to a certain extent, meet the intent because you have, of course, the big, the big commercial at one end, but there's also stores that are being planned as part of uh, discovery, this, that all uh, role of commercial areas at the, uh, under those new 
apartments there. So um, it does, I mean, it will link to commercial areas. So I think it's very important to put the resources and put the, the emphasis on uh, making that a real asset to the community. And what was proposed today was certainly a lot closer to what I had thought of when I first saw it on the map but that the previous um, graphic did not quite represent, even though the, the language uh, that uh, condition number 43, was it? Or 53, what, Or 53 think. was already there. So um, I, I don't know how we can make sure that it doesn't get lost again, that you know, since it wasn't quite there last time, even though the condition was there, uh, the, the public uh, seeding, the, um, it talks about public arts, fountains, you know, that uh, seating areas, uh, gathering places. Um, somebody was mentioning maybe some kind of a shelter halfway down to, um, um, you know, as, you know, as protect from the rain or whatever, or find kids finding something to do with it. So just give it a little bit of uh, complexity and interest. Um, because I, I do, I, I have the feeling that it will be, and it certainly will be for me, but I think it will be a, a, a big asset to the, the whole community, not just to the, the residents of uh, the development. Thank you. Any other comments on the plaza? Go ahead, Nina. Thank you. Uh, it's, I like doing this by topic, but it does make it uh, challenging because some of these topics are, are uh, mixed together and one thing that Eric said about this the original intent wasn't that this was going to be a residential um, Plot and if and when we get to talking about the definition of enhancement units you might say well uh, perhaps it's already going off um, from the intended use here and that's why the plaza is not fulfilling its original intent is because the plat um, features don't have it either. So I, I do want to say that it's really great to get the response to the questions we had about the plaza last time and the dramatic improvement between the thoroughfare that we had last time, which was a couple pathways in a really beautiful area, and I can't believe I'm voting for hardscape when what I really always like is grass. Uh, but in this case, uh, it does if it makes, yeah, but I like the connect, connect too. Uh, it does make for the usable gathering place. I think the big question for the commission is who was supposed to be gathering there? Is it a gathering space for the residents along the promenade or, or not promenade, along the plaza, or was it supposed to be a plaza for Issaquah Highlands? And I think that if we could answer that question, we can answer whether this complies. Well, uh, yeah, I, thank you. Now, I think that. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucy, but the idea was it was a plaza for the, what was high streets or I can't remember what we called some of the other ones, but the other commercial centers that were going to extend from end to end truly. And this was never, I say, I don't, so I don't recall it ever being planned for residential and it became that, that that's why I believe that the intent of the plaza is less relevant here. Now it may bring up the question, should we have should we still take that idea of a plaza and put it elsewhere in the community? But, you know, but, but I think because this is residential, it doesn't serve the same purpose as it would have it, had this been tying together all those, all those retail, even though there, there may be and will likely be some, re, some commercial or retail at, at Discovery Drive, you know, that's, you know, we have retail at Block 8, you know, and we're not, it's just there, right? I mean, it's... I, so I do think people will use the corridor. I think it's a corridor. I don't think it's a plaza. I still think it's a beautiful promenade, corridor, we can call it whatever we want. I just think the intent is different now, and, and that's why I'm okay with it. Do you want to talk about enhancement units? Might as well, because, yeah, because if we're okay with this being a housing development, then I, I'm okay with this being a plaza of the current design, too. Yeah, I don't know that we have a choice. We, we I mean, it is... thinking about, and Lucy can help because she has uh, some experience and some of the rest of you were involved in this too, about the enhancement units and the amendment to the development agreement. 
for the, with the transfer and development rights that came in, 500 units. I remember this going uh, to the land and shore, and I attended those meetings as much as I could. Uh, um, interestingly, to Connie's point, those aren't videotaped, and uh, the minutes are taken as best they can, but I remember very clearly because I was following Maureen McCary quite closely in this as the Land and Shore Committee was trying to fulfill the Urban Village Development Commission's work. And I clearly remember a day where she said, now Judd, I don't want to be just handing you another housing development because that is not what we want. We've, been, we've gotten plenty of that and we're looking for a mixed use urban setting. And it was very difficult to negotiate some language that would fulfill that. You know, if we're talking about the record and the intent, does, does the enhancement units being mixed use or urban scale, how do we, how do we assure that uh, intent? And the intent was for many reasons. One was to create something that wasn't just a housing development for the city's sake because housing doesn't provide for the city like commercial real estate does. Uh, the other was the vision of mixed use, and this is definitely not a mixed use. Uh, I mean, I love the house, uh, the um, offices on the main, on the street side, but it doesn't constitute what anyone would call mixed use. So anyway, just bring that up for um, part of the circle of the topic, talk. Um, so m it was mixed use or 40 feet. So um, while I, and I think that you're right. I mean, we're all relying on memory and general notes. Um, I, my memory was that there was a concern about more single family detached and just kind of more subdivisions, which has been kind of the default for a lot of the um, uh, residential areas. And so there was a goal to have um, uh, denser and or mixed use. So uh, when Polygon came to uh, the city with uh, this proposal, one of the questions they wanted clarity on was the 40 feet. Because since it steps down, some of these are tuck under units, is it measured from the front, from the back? You know, what, how do we interpret that? So we went back to Land and Shore and said, we need to talk through this because we want to make sure we're meeting your intent. Um, and in talking about that, what they recognized was that 40 feet wasn't inherently the, um, wasn't inherently going to create the kind of neighborhoods they were expecting. It was more about density. And so um, that is what the uh, action memo captures is that the council determined that density was meeting their intent more than the height was, even though these units are generally 40 feet tall, depending on how you measure them. So um, I think, I, I just, I guess what I want to emphasize is that we wanted to ensure that we were implementing that intent and we needed greater clarity and that's what the council provided us with in terms of identifying that density was really a better reflection of what they were asking for than height. So at this point, we, we can't debate whether or not residential is appropriate here or not, right? Well, r residential wouldn't have been the choice, I mean, about whether um, it met it or not, because all along, you could have a solely residential project. It was not resident 40 feet and mixed mm -hmm. use, it was or. Okay. Um, but in terms of uh, is 20 dwelling units per acre the right um, touch point, I think that is they've identified that 20 was satisfactory to them to meet the urban density. Are you satisfied with your, where we are? Okay. Um, some of the other topics were parking, bikes, lighting. Um, any issues with parking at this point? I mean, I, I personally think they've provided enough parking for it. Um, my, my biggest concern on this is enforcement. 
and I, you know, I'm not going to get all crazy about it again, but I, I'm telling you, it's not happening today in the most obvious of places. I, I was share an anecdote yesterday I drove out to go to the gym there was a car three feet on high street three feet sticking out in the lane I came back from the gym it was still sticking out I called the police they said oh yeah we ticketed that car great five o'clock I drove out it was three feet out on the high street still I came back at 7 30 it was three feet out on the high street you know if we can't and this is in front of the movie theater where there's hundreds of cars going in and out of there now if we can't enforce on the most obvious places in the highlands, how are we going to enforce on an alley? And I've got real issues with that. So as a management company, as a HOA, they have the ability to tow within the alleys much more easily than... The, than well, the police have the ability to do it too, but it's not happening. So Well, I, I, think, I think what you're identifying with the police... Um, this one example, it's happening right, no, all over the place. So I just, I, again, I'm just saying, I think we're adding to the problem, not taking away from the problem by creating, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of alley space with hundreds and hundreds of units being serviced by them. And while it doesn't go against what is, you know, I, I can't say I'm not going to prove this because of that. I'm just telling you. It causes problems, and as someone that's been on this commission for 14 years, lived in this community for 15 years, this is all about personal experience, not personal preference. And I just, you know, if it means nothing to everybody, fine, that's cool. But there's a reason why I get all riled up about it, it's because it happens every single day, and we're just adding to the problem. When people ask me to represent them here, they're asking me to fix problems, not cause more. And I feel like I'm causing more problems by condoning this basically that's what it comes down to well I, I mean Jeff I think the point of one of the points that you're identifying that I, I don't have a good answer for is you know it's a city policy approach to not pay for parking enforcement to not have staff that does that um, it's a financial and a policy um, and I guess I can I can only request that that the the applicant have a very stated, clear stated policy on what the rules are, and if someone's violating those rules, what the course of action is, and that somebody follows through on that course of action. Because beyond that, you know, I'm not going to tow them. I'm not going to ticket them. I, there's nothing I can do about it. But if people live there and they're frustrated, like they live on my street and they're frustrated, like they live on the street next to me and they're frustrated. It, it, it all it makes for is angry neighbors, you know. And and you know I I, I do com you know that's why you had the card of the police officer. I do try and communicate that to them, and I would be glad to communicate it to the administration again. I just uh, this is so interesting to me because we were talking about uh, to comparing this with the Z homes or with the YWCA who people move there and choose to not have vehicles, but that is a prime example of a daily problem that there isn't enough or the right kind of parking at Z Home. They expect you to have a smart car, but they don't. And when I've been to YWCA residential meetings, one is the first thing they talk about, parking. And they've had to implement all sorts of rules because they haven't had enough parking. And it's, and it's frustrating. So even at a place where there's a transit-oriented development and where we hope here that these people won't be driving cars, uh, and we'd really like to design a place where they don't. Uh, I, and maybe the answer is to strip away this parking and make them not take cars into these alleys. But that's obviously not, because people will continue to want parks. It's, it's parking. It's an urban village in a suburban setting. And at the, especially the market value of these homes, you're right. They're not going to be working at Safeway. They're going to be working at Amazon or Microsoft or maybe Swedish. But you're right. There's something that needs to be um, a reality that needs to be accepted and accommodated for at least the current state. Thank you. Carl, did you want to touch on lighting or are we okay with where we were? No, I think okay. We Anybody else want to talk about lighting? I think we've addressed that. What about bikes? Uh, any concerns about? I, I have one question about bikes. I saw that on the on the plaza, you had um, bike racks at one end of it, maybe two ends. I don't know. 
I, I'm trying to understand the purpose of those bike racks, really. Um, I mean, I guess I, I love the idea of bike racks, but I just don't know how useful those are at the end of the plaza. Yeah, why would you park it there and walk to where? And if you live there, you're not going to park your bike there probably because, I mean, maybe you will, but it could be you know, susceptible to damage or theft or something. So I don't know. I'm just curious if that's really necessary. Sure. The Where those bike racks were shown was just, I just wanted to show that it was one of the items we're thinking of. There, at this point, there we still need to go through ARC review, city review. There was not, for this purpose, there was not, um, I guess, a lot of thought put into where those particular bike racks were. I just wanted to show yeah. these are theoretical elements that could be in the plaza. Okay. So. And I, again, I like the idea of bike racks. I think they're probably necessary, but I'd just be, you know, thoughtful where you put them and how they'll be used. Um, and then the point of, you know, I think David Kapler's point, I'm less concerned about people using it as a thoroughfare with, you know, fast bikes going through because I think there are a lot of other options. But I am concerned about the fact that, you know, if, it, if people if were expecting people to ride their bikes on the plaza, you know, and, but they're parking their bikes behind their houses in the garages, it's just going to be a little bit weird. I think they're really going to just use the alleys to ride their bikes. Yeah, well, I, you know, if you're talking the difference in kids and commuters and whatnot, you know, kid, kids are going to, they're like water. They're just going to go wherever there's a crack and an opening, and yeah. they're going to yeah. go everywhere. I think road bikes, you know, if I were looking, I'd be coming down, you know, Ellis or, Discovery. what is this, 10th? 10th, yeah. I'd be coming down 10th to head over to Swedish or something. So I, I don't see through the development as an issue for the high-speed bikes and yeah. commuters personally. Okay. I appreciate Mr. Kepler's comments and yep. awareness, though. Any other comments on that? Any other topics we didn't cover that you'd like to address? Live work units, anything? No? I just had a comment about the loading zones. Just, you know, in the alleyway, you're still, like, if you're talking a big moving truck, You'd be, you said that people would have other places to go, but if you're in a home, you're not going to be able to leave your home if that's the only place for moving trucks to be is in your alleyway. And is there any other, you know, I know parking is very limited and it's very kind of lopsided on, on you know, 20, block 20 versus block 21, but if there was any other place where you could kind of tuck like a big moving van or something like that, I don't know if that's possible given the current layout. Um. Moving vans are a challenge. I think one of the things that we've seen is that over time, moving companies have realized that bringing the full 18-wheelers in is just not very practical. So you don't really see them coming in. Um, I think the other piece, uh, you know, it's trying to balance how much um, paving you have against uh, functionality for the time that those things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, you know, a moving company is, is truck to house, truck to house, truck to house, and therefore they are um, accommodating of, you know, a neighbor that needs to get out while they're yeah. servicing it. So, you know, I would agree that um, it's not ideal. I think it works better on the east side where you have this row of parallel parking that could be, uh, you know, I don't know how it is in your neighborhood, but in my neighborhood when a moving truck or some other kind of construction or something, delivery truck is coming, you know, you put up sign, you know, you can get signs and you're able to reserve it for a half a day and, um, and be able to use those spaces. Well, I didn't know if even like if you look at parcel is it block 20 the one on the east like along the west side of nine where there's no driveways impacted like if that could be considered a loading zone or like on block 21 to the west side of 29 you know if you kind of kind of establish that there are kind of some loading zones that don't inconvenience others so um, just to make sure I'm understanding Stephanie are you suggesting for instance that that this here? Um, the other side of the building, the west side. Oh, over here. Of, yeah, that block nine. Just, you know, if the curb were painted loading zone or whatever, just so it's someplace that it's kind of out of the way and does inconveniences, you know, so it's not a specific set-aside parallel parking 
in pull in the situation, but it's someplace that it wouldn't interfere with right as many houses um, as possible. Which might also address the situation of somebody just saying, well, it's not marked, so I'll just park there. And I was saying, I, just, I realized I just said that too. It could be like a curb painted, but if there's no curb. There's no curb, but I'm just saying like, so. see, the, the, <laughs> what, what, we're, what we're seeing today is residents yeah. are saying, finding every place where there's no sign or no painted curb and they go, mm -hmm. oh, there's nothing there, I can just park here. It's fine. Or pulling in front of a parking <laughs> space and then yeah, servicing the whole neighborhood, the, the UPS truck or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, so I don't know, it's just a suggestion. Hmm? Um, so I'm wondering, I'm trying to look at uh, the um, conditions, and I don't know that it's a perfect fit, um, but would the um, mail kiosk condition, if we also talked about uh, where uh, trying to identify spaces that would um, have less likely to impact? Yeah, okay. Lucy, thanks for bringing that up. I actually had that in my notes and got overtaken by my other ideas. But previously when we had talked about mail kiosks, it was often we sort of threw up our collective hands and said USPS does sort of what they want to do and then we, or the tail being wagged. This sounds more like we can recommend them to do something. Is that, am I well, hearing that correctly? Actually, we are the tail being wagged. Pretty much the only way we get, um, that we can push back with USPS is around ADA issues, which isn't really a big one for these kinds of units. However, um, what we do is work with applicants to try and identify good locations that are safe and uh, positive assets to the community and then they work with USPS to try and you know knowing what those preferences are to see if they can make those happen so it, it it's kind of a reverse order because if I were USPS I can see exactly where I want to put my kiosks up there you put parallel parking spaces just so you can pull <laughs> in just for me well I mean I guess that's what I'm thinking about in terms of some of the locations that we've identified um, I'm wondering uh, what we've done, you know, we, we need to provide a place for the postal carrier to pull over, but we don't want it to become a parking space. So we've used a couple of different design techniques and I'm wondering if there's a way to make that a loading space that would both serve the mail carrier and potentially uh, moving trucks uh, at the same time. Now that would only be one or two per side um, but trying to look at those kind of design opportunities when we're getting down into the construction details. My only concern about getting, spending too much time on loading zones is if you were to put a loading zone, let's say at the corner, Stephanie was talking about, any UPS FedEx guy would use that if he were serving one of the 20 houses that's close. Otherwise, he's going to go yeah. whatever's close. So I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And United Van Lines is going to go where the door is where the door is because they don't want to truck furniture well, I back mean, and united forth, van so. lines you know they're coming and you're able to work something out right. i mean us honestly usps i'm mean, not usps fedex and ups blocks my street they just stop yeah. i mean because there's my street has parallel parking on either side and you have to negotiate it's a queuing street essentially yeah. and they just stop in the middle of the street and you wait for them yeah. um i i don't like it but it, you Which know, is why it, I think no matter what we do, that is yeah. what they will do, and we all live with it. So. Right, but that, but in my street, there isn't 18 feet from car to car, and uh, there is in this circumstance. So I, I think the, um, the question is how likely they are going to be to pull to one side, therefore a car can squeak around, or not. Um, and I think they're more likely to do that. Mm -hmm. How many milk kiosks should we think are going to be placed in this community roughly that's another thing that comes down to the USPS I mean th if it were up to them they would have mail kiosks located in one place for the entire site mm -hmm. because that's all they want to do um, with this I would see there being probably two different locations uh, one on block 21 one on block 22 um, Wow. 
probably not very convenient for some of the residents. I mean, I, I, we always push to have as many as we can get because yeah. you're right, it is more convenient for the residents. But, um, you know, I've had single family plats larger than this where they, 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 they've told me we want to put them all in one place, 250 units in one place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, any other topics you want to discuss? All right, do we have any, uh, we need to go to a, uh, to a vote. Do we have anything to add to this? Well, I was just trying to draft something related to the load zones okay. and the mail kiosk. Okay. In the meantime, um, any other comments from the applicant? Well, I, I was going to say, addressing your concern about the parking, um, you know, with this being a, a private community with an HOA, I think that we do have we actually we can do something about it where you know the police they can come and they can ticket somebody um, but we could ticket we could have someone towed um, I, I, I think this gives us a little bit more opportunity to actually control that um, so I think that that's you know knowing that the situation that we'll have with this I mean that's something that we'll need to be mindful of when we write up the, the, the declaration uh, okay that. thank you You want to be able to read it, right? What is crossing purpose? off or underlining? Underlining. Oh. <laughs> it's it's my legislative marking. Um, so let's see if this this language works. So condition forty four reads right now: locate the mail kiosk. So the high activity functions are gathered in central areas. You can follow this on page 16 of the memo, sorry. Uh, and then it continues, the location should be in proximity to roads for USPS mail carriers and should not conflict with parallel parking stalls. In addition, look for opportunities to add marked loading zones, possibly in conjunction with mail kiosks and USPS mail carrier parking. Can I suggest that you say, um, you know, and continue 44 with or add to 44? This is, that's why it says 44 at the beginning. Right, I'm just saying on, uh, so, it's not a new condition, so right, it's amended okay, commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, amended or, yeah. yeah. yeah in a, okay. Okay. Who would like to speak? Anybody? <laughs> we have a draft motion for approval blocks 21 and 22 site development permit. I move that the Urban Village Development Commission approve blocks 21 and 22 site development permit file number STP 13-00002 as described in the staff report dated June 11, 2013, its attachments A through F, the briefing response memo dated June 18, 2013, and subject to the terms, conditions, and rationale contained in the staff report and briefing response memo and as amended this evening. Add to condition 44. In addition, look for opportunities to add marked loading zones, possibly in conjunction with mail kiosk and USPS mail carrier parking. Also, I move that the Urban Village Development Commission direct the Development Services Department to prepare findings of fact and conclusions for review and approval by the Urban Village Development Commission chairperson affirming the Urban Village Development Commission's decision to approve the site development permit application for Issaquah Highlands Blocks 21 and 22, file number STP 13-00002, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report, briefing response memo, and as amended this evening. Was good responsive reading. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passed unanimously. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to um, just open additional business. Um, does anybody have anything? 
No? Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm thrilled that the movie theater has opened up. Uh, the plaza the, out in front of the theater has been well used in the last three days. Um, I only question I have on it is do, do we, well, I'm not even sure we can get this answered, but, you know, they're using hardscapes and so forth for people to sit on and stuff. I just, it's, it's not... Cozy? It's not, well, it's not that it's not cozy. It's just the, all the places to sit are really low, and then the other parts that are not low are wet because they have the water feature. So I just don't know if it's complete. I don't know if they're putting benches or other things. It just, so I don't know if we can get some information to them that says... You, you agree, I, Carl? I don't mind sitting on a concrete wall. I do mind sitting on one that's three inches off the ground. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. So I don't know if it's complete, uh, and we can we can wait to see. But if not, I'd like to know what the opportunity is to have further discussions about, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of a review, I guess. Well, uh, we're not meeting regularly with Regency now because uh, uh, the theater's open, but. Uh, so I don't think that, so all we have right now for this project is a temporary certificate of occupancy. And there is, as far as I know, been, other than safety, there is no inspection of the plaza. I mean, I, I know I haven't gone out. So I, I don't know that the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that I can do is share um, a plan or something so that you can at least see what it's supposed to be or I can and, and I guess the question is does the Commission want that like tomorrow or do you want me to bring it at the next meeting no I think the next meeting is fine because I think it's not just that plaza but also what's going in 17 B you okay. know if, if there's some issues to to uh, address yeah, beforehand that would be great and that sort of thing just and it's not a criticism by any stretch just let's no. make sure it's doing we're doing the right thing and then one other question as we're walking through Carl and I did a tour of, of most of the parking lots and so forth was in the back to the motorcycle parking but motorcycle and scooter parking I think are going to be important still I didn't see a single spot in any of the garages parking lots or anything was there not a requirement or was it just a suggestion a wish it's, it is a Highlands it's just a consideration and we looked for opportunities, but they had they had they I brought in a special designer, so there was no leftover space. So the only place that there's motorcycle parking is on Temp. Makes zero sense. I I understand. I understand. I think we need to have that discussion with them too, because all you do is take one spot in each of the lots and you split it into three little mot motorcycle scooter parking spots, and you've got your deal done. Otherwise, one bike's going to take up one car spot, and you're and you're causing more problems rather than fixing them. Okay. And if we want to encourage people to go on scooters or e-bikes or whatever they are, we got to be doing that sort of thing. So, on a positive note, if I may, thank you for the discussion tonight in the Regency. As I was walking around there several times over the weekend, it's a great example of the kind of discussion that we have working with city staff and different applicants to realize visions. And you walked through there and you saw. For instance, when you come in and it's a driveway, but it's got the bollards and it's got change in the surface that had the kind of effect we were looking for. So I appreciate everybody working together and having these kinds of discussions. I was, I'm very proud to have been yeah. working through this process. I, I agree, and I think it's coming along, coming along very quickly and very nicely. And uh, you know, still there will be a lot of questions, and I, I hope that once we make these decisions, they're not just done deals and they go, okay, go run with it, um, but that we continue the discussion and try and make things better. So. Thank you. Thanks, Commission. Anything else? I, I have a couple things. Yes. So um, one thing, I want to thank the Commission. I, I know this is a hard discussion tonight, and I think the important piece of it is trying to, um, the hard part is that we're each trying to figure out what it is that is the uncomfortable, unhappy part and how much we can do about which piece of it. And I also appreciate that sometimes uh, it's hard to know. I mean, I'm already driving through there and having reactions and thinking, I wish I'd thought of that, you know, before it was built. Um, so I, I think it's really important to, we, we may not be able to go back and change them, but knowing where you think things are working and think things are not working is a really important piece. I think because we do spend a lot of time negotiating with applicants and, and the conversations that we have here have a huge impact <clears throat> on those conversations. So I really appreciate all the feedback that we get because it makes it 
uh, it, it makes us more thoughtful representatives and to try and facilitate your perspective even before we get in front of you. So um, we don't take these conversations lightly. Second, um, we're doing something unusual at the next meeting, and I want to give you a heads up. Um, and I've told you this already, but I just want to remind you. The next meeting, we are doing a preliminary plat in one whole meeting. The reason that we, we think that is a um, possible thing is it is 12 lots. It's kind of a crazy little plat. And so um, it is uh, the property that is next door to Z Home. Uh, so everything is fixed on every single side. Uh, it's completely flat. Uh, it's 12 attached townhomes ho on single lots. So um, we will, uh, you know, we may even have to take a break in the middle of, <laughs> you too, um, a break in the middle so that we, you know, because we won't have the chance to go away and do the briefing response memo. So we, <laughs> no, no, it's not that at all. Just that we're going to want to sit down and, and uh, take all the comments we're hearing and be able to thoughtfully respond to them as opposed to doing everything on the fly. The 16th Two of weeks July. Today, right? yeah. How does that affect public comment? Oh, I mean, there'll be, it, it will be probably um, structured um, almost like uh, the brief, the uh, workshop and the hearing probably on either side of that. So we'll do the regular sort of presentation and uh, reading through the conditions, taking public comment taking a break and, and commission comment, taking a break and seeing if we want to propose changes, maybe drafting some things, then coming back and doing the official hearing part. So it, it'll, it'll have, I think, the, I mean, it's a great question, and I, I'm sort of making this up as I'm going along, uh, that, uh, it, you know, I think it'll have the same structure. It'll just all be in one night. So I just wanted to give you a heads up because that's um, not the way we usually do it. Okay. All right, so we'll see everybody in two weeks. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.